pedestrian safety. Um, maintenance of traffic during construction, a huge issue. Understandably, residents and business owners um, were very vocal at the meetings, which was great. Um, it altered how we changed our concept for maintaining traffic. So we, we always weigh, is it better to get in and out quickly, which typically requires a detour, or do we maintain traffic, endure a little bit more inconvenience during construction, but make sure that we maintain access the entire time. And that's what we, we settled on. We'll be maintaining two-way traffic at all times throughout the project. Um, it, there's gonna be congestion, there's gonna be inconvenience, but we will maintain access at all times. Uh, right-of-way parcels, I touched on that a little bit. Um, to make sure that uh, the pathways that are being constructed and driveways that are tying into the brand new road, because it is reconstruct, we're not keeping the existing pavement and just tying back in. It's a total reconstruct, so there's a little bit of change in the elevations. We've got numerous um, property owners and property owner agreements that MDOT has met with one-on-one -on -one to talk through um, the changes in front of a, a resident or a business owner's property, and we've got agreements signed um, to allow us to go in and make those grading changes to their property. Stormwater quality, also very, very important on this project. We have, um, we'll be maintaining the city's existing stormwater chamber um, down by West End Beach. We're gonna be adding a new one um, for the outlet up by the M72 intersection. Uh, a couple of live streams that we'll be protecting and retaining for their outlet directly into the bay. Um, and we're actually upsizing some of this, the pipes within Grandview and the outlets so that in the future, this was again something that came out of the public meetings, um, so that in the future, if the Slabtown neighborhood makes improvements to their drainage that <coughs> currently ties into the, the public um, storm system in Grandview Parkway, MDOT system can pick it up. MDOT system is designed with this project to pick up future upsizing of Slabtown. Um, utility coordination has been ongoing, uh, most notably with the Traverse City Light and Power, um, since we will be making uh, adjustments to the existing overhead street lights and adding lighting at um, the new roundabout as well as some of the pedestrian crossings. Um, and that's the light, last item, lighting again. So um, I mentioned going back all the way to 2010 for the previous studies, but the last four years, three years, uh, is when most of our stakeholder outreach and um, public engagement efforts have been taking place. Um, starting, I had mentioned the road safety audit that took place in 2020 of February, where the stakeholders are previously mentioned, participated in that, um, brought to light things that might have um, we might not have known about, um, <coughs> anecdotal as well as historic information. And then in 21, um, that was when MDOT combined both of the projects on M22 and Grandview Parkway. Um, in 20, October of 21 was the first official meeting with the township, but then in um, April 22 is when we knew that um, the, the piece in the city, uh, Traverse City needed to have its own standalone um, road safety audit report, so that was conducted. Uh, our first public meeting for the project was held in June 2022, so almost two years ago. Um, and then we had a follow-up meeting in September of 22 with all the stakeholders um, the city, the township, TART, and BETA, uh, majority stake stakeholders, really. And then the um, in September, another public meeting. So we had a, a three very significant meetings there in 2022. Then coming into 23, um, we started to have more discussions with Discovery Pier, since they were making significant improvements to their um, facility up north of the city. Um, March, we had the meeting with the Slabtown Neighborhood Traffic and Street Committee, very helpful. And then in April 24, just last week, we had another public meeting at Elmwood, Elmwood Township Hall again. And here we are today at the commission meeting giving y'all uh, an update. So our plan completion for this project is September of this year. And uh, a contractor will be, will be selected um, and the award will be granted this year for an April 2025 construction start all things going per plan. I actually missed a couple of the meetings there at the bottom of my timeline. I overlooked it, um, two additional meetings in June of 23 and November of 23. But the point is, we've had a lot of really good and ongoing discussion with the public, with our stakeholders, um, and we appreciate everyone's time and effort because it takes, takes more than just uh, the design engineers to make this work. It's gotta work for the community, and we really appreciate the time and effort that everybody has contributed. 
this slide I included because it, it really tells the story of where we started from two years ago in June of 2022, where we came up with ideas. They were just concept of what Grandview, concepts of what Grandview Parkway would look like or could look like. And based on the public information and the stakeholder engagement, what, what the final design looks like doesn't look like any of these. Because all those comments on the right part of the slides there, those were all the comments we got back. We, we sifted through them all. We actually got more last week that we're in the process of distilling down. But this is the information that, dis, that informed our project to where it is today. Very useful, very different from those five al alternatives that we presented in 2022. So um, again, very appreciative of everybody's time and effort to make this the best project, project possible. And so this is just a blow up of what the Grandview um, segment looks like today. Uh, the roundabout retains access at Bay Street. Um, that was a controversial issue at the beginning. Some folks were for it, some folks were against it. Um, the majority of the, the people that spoke about it and looking at emergency access, um, it was decided that we would keep the access off of Bay Street and, and provide an approach into the roundabout from Bay Street. <coughs> Uh, it also retains the Hawk signal, um, the existing pedestrian crossing signal at near Elmwood uh, by the beach. Um, it also retains almost all of the green space currently between Bay and Grand, eastbound Grandview Parkway. Um, and it also retains that parkway, the, the pathway that's currently in that green space. We're not removing that. So our, our design today keeps the existing pathway on the south side of Grandview and widens the pathway on the water side of Grandview. So now you have parallel um, pathways on both sides of the parkway. Um, I said that it retains almost all of the green space between Bay and eastbound Grandview. We have to shift it five feet over. We're shifting the alignment of the roadway five feet closer to Slabtown. Um, one of the previous uh, options that were shown in the previous slide showed it um, initially showed the roadway being significantly closer to Slabtown, which was unacceptable from the information we got back. So we went back to the drawing board, figured out, okay, what is the absolute minimum that we need to shift the road in order to maintain a 12-foot bike path along the river side on the on the bay side? So that's that's how we were able to make it fit. So we did have to shift it five feet closer to Slabtown. A um, couple of benefits from this design, more benefits from this design. Um, the roundabout tends to reduce congestion. In fact, it's a safety measure that um, the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Program at MDOT promotes when um, we're looking at intersection improvement alternatives because you don't have cars sitting idling at a signal. So um, again, besides the operational and safety benefits, there are air quality benefits to the roundabout. The second thing, um, this, this new pavement will be um, asphalt, it won't be concrete, which studies show has um, several decibels less uh, in road tire noise than concrete. So those are some nice benefits um, of the, the final design. Um, I don't think I mentioned the benefits. So specifically with the non-motorized pathway improvements, I mentioned that we'll have a continuous 12-foot sh shared use pathway along Grandview. And then um, the, the TART Trail will be along Grandview. It'll go north of the M72 proposed roundabout. It will cross over to the west side, to the land side, where it will go all the way up to Cherry Bend and um, hopefully connect to a future Cherry Bend Trail that's going to go westerly along Cherry Bend Road. On the water side of M22 going north, there will still be a trailway, it just won't be 12 feet wide. It'll be a little bit narrower, it'll be <coughs> about 10 feet wide in many locations, and then down to five feet wide, whereby the restaurants at the north end, it gets very narrow, but we will continue it all the way up to Cherry Bend. It will be continuous. Um, high visibility crosswalk locations. So there's some key locations where um, Besides at M72 and down at West End Beach, as you go north, there's some destinations where pedestrians, bicyclists um, are often found, and we wanted to make sure that there were um, safer crossings, enhanced markings, pedestrian refuge islands at key locations um, outside of the city to the north, but as well also down in the city at the roundabout, um, designed at the, the approach legs for the roundabout. And like I said, we're going to keep the pedestrian crossing at Elmwood by West End Beach. But we're enhancing it. We're replacing the span wire with mast arms. 
um, so it'll be a little bit more visible, more, more pronounced, and then in, in improving the lighting, the overhead lighting at any pedestrian crossing. Uh, mentioned the connection to Leelanau Trail, and um, we're retaining all the pathways along Bay Street. So um, for someone in Slabtown, if they don't have to cross Grandview Parkway to get to the pathway, they can stay on the neighborhood side and still use the, the trails on the, the resident side. Um, the pedestrian safety, we recognize how important this is, um, not only just in the summertime, but for the residents that are here all year round. Um, we wanted to make sure that all the pedestrian crossings are accessible for all users. They're visible um, and lighted. They're site specific. And what I mean by that is we were very thoughtful in, in talking with property owners and business owners about the destinations that these would, would be most practical at. So um, we'd have three additional crossings um, north of the city to be added at very site specific locations that are optimally located. Um, and safe for all users. For example, um, we, the, some of the feedback we got was if we are going to have a hawk signal, a, a signalized signal, or even a, just an enhanced crossing, make sure that there was enough pedestrian refuge for, say, a bicyclist that has a, a child trailer on the back of their bike. So make sure that um, there's enough space to accommodate multiple pedestrians as well as bikes that may have trailers. And so that's what we have done. And this, uh, this slide here, um, it's just uh, an overview, kind of showing the overall project limits. I know it's, it's difficult to see, but if during our question and answer period, I can zoom in on this, um, it'll have a lot better clarity and it'll be more legible and we can look at specific locations that you may have questions on. And MDOT is maintaining a project web page. Um, the information from last week's public meeting has not been uploaded yet, but it should be uploaded this week. But you can see all of our previous project information, um, including all of the public comments, if you choose to visit their, their website. So we can just turn right, right off of Bay Street onto the parkway? Into the, gotta, into the roundabout first, yeah. Or do you have to go through the roundabout and all the way around? Oh, you, 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 it would be your first right when you go into yeah, the so roundabout, in it, it's in your first right. Mm -hmm. yep. And I can zoom in on that, I know it's hard to see. Um, really quickly for our request for us to help you out a little, that site is very long um, and clunky, so could we, do we have that abridged somewhere on our site where people could find it to, uh, on the city site so it's an easy one stop? Yes, it's at the Grandview Parkway project page on the city website. Fantastic, so no one has to be jotting down all of that just yet. Right. So. <laughs> Any other questions right now? Jackie, I see you have to. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I would be very interested in, in hearing more details about the feedback from the Slabtown neighborhood. Um, I have received some, some concerned comments regarding not only noise, but also vibration from uh, commercial traffic uh, as the parkway is shifted closer to residences. So if you could fill us in on that. Much of the, 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 the large commercial vehicles that um, are trying to ride on the very potholed, um, joint vaulted roadway right now. That will be eliminated with a smoother pavement, with the HMA pavement. Um, just, I should say, regardless of the nature of the pavement, getting making the pavement improvements will be a, a huge um, improvement. Um, but like I said, going to an HMA rather than a concrete pavement um, tends to reduce decibel levels by several, several points. Um, I don't off the top of my head know what those numbers are. Um, Matt might here in our office or uh, Lucas may, but it's notable, it's noticeable, um, and I can certainly provide that research information to you. That would be great. I Thank you. Were there, were there other um, issues that were of high importance in the neighborhood feedback? Walkability. They were very concerned that they were going to have to cross Grandview Parkway in order to um, use any kind of sidewalk network. And so that was important that we kept and, and connected everything at Bay Street um, up to the M72 connections. 
Commissioner Stanley. So I actually am a Slab Town resident and I attended that June 14th, 2022 meeting at the Elmwood Township Hall. I grew up in Elmwood Township off of Cherry Bend. Uh, so this is my stomping grounds. I'm three houses down from Bay Street. Um, our backyard looks over uh, into, into the Darrow Park area right to on Bay Street. So I really appreciate the connectivity um, from the neighborhood on those um, trails. I often walk from our house to Tom's, to Rite Aid, um, to the restaurants that are north of us on um, M22 there. And so that, that's a critical feature. I'm very happy to see the roundabout. Uh, ever since I moved into the house that I'm in on Bay, uh, mm -hmm. off of Bay Street, I have thought, golly, this looks like the perfect opportunity to have a roundabout. I, instead of spending uh, sometimes four to five light cycles idling at the uh, stop sign, waiting to turn onto 72 and then get onto the parkway. So I'm very um, happy to see that you have incorporated that feedback from myself and others in the Slabtown neighborhood. And also I know other people who are in, uh, who are north of the city as well, who rely on those connections. So thank you for your responsiveness there. You're welcome. Thank you for coming out to the meeting and spending your time with us. I, I would add that there were some folks from Slabtown that wanted um, Bay Street closed. Mm -hmm. They were, they were very passionate about it. They wanted Bay Street closed. They noted that um, on the weekends, there are bike groups that like to stage there before they head off. And, and they would like to see that used more as a recreation space. So that is something I'm sure that in the future, if the city chooses to you know, investigate that further, it's totally possible. Absolutely, just because it's connecting um, to the roundabout now, the use for Bay Street could change. Mr. Warner. Yeah, I'm sure you're aware of the 1947 agreement between the state of Michigan and the city. Um, and in light of that, I would like to think there would have been some meetings prior to this one um, that included the city and maybe with the tur turmoil uh, at the city manager's level. Uh, there were letters <coughs> sent by MDOT to the city that weren't responded to, I don't know. Uh, but my concern is what's best for the city of Traverse City. And with that 1947 agreement, we do have leverage. Um, and most of my concern gets to uh, limited park space. Essentially, it's park uh, from that roundabout intersection all the way back to Division along the Bayfront. Uh, and to have the community conversation about how to maximize that park space and what's the best use of that park space. Um, and so I think uh, we as a commission have a responsibility uh, to advocate for the city. Um, and so I'm just sharing that. I don't necessarily have a question unless you're aware of letters that got sent to the city that were not responded to. Off the top of my head, I am, I am not, sir. But Dan Wagner, I know from MDOT, has been very uh, active in having those discussions over the last at least 18 months that I'm aware of. So, oh, I don't like that. I can speak to the uh, evolution of the trail portion a little bit. Uh, this project's been really interesting. I've, I've been in this role I'm in now for about three years, and Lucas about three and a half. When we actually took um, this project over, it was already in the state-approved uh, um, transportation plan, the five-year plan that we talked about. And that project uh, basically was just to put back the pavement that was there. And through our discussions and our stakeholder engagement in the adjacent um, project, we heard, we learned that the existing TAR trail, the 10-foot wide trail that's been there for 25-ish years, I wanna say, was, it was under capacity. It didn't have enough capacity. So um, we actually looked at doing what we were calling at that time the flip-flop, which was to move the parkway in put the park, um, put the tart trail on the water side and make it slightly wider. So go from like 10 feet to 12 feet or maybe even 14 feet. And then, um, and going through our stakeholder engagement early on, the folks from TART said, hey, we've got an even better idea. Let's keep the existing tart trail and you just add another one. And so our costs were essentially the same to do that. So that's kind of uh, what that uh, conversation grew into what is, which has resulted in what's shown here tonight, so. Oh, and I appreciate that, but that's TART, not the city. Uh, though the Venn diagram, sometimes there's significant overlap and they, we might have the same interests, but until the city uh, as an entity decides what its goals are, 
Uh, they might overlap significantly with TART, and sure. they might not, depending on what's, what the community says they would like to see along the Bayfront there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, uh, and by saying TART, I mean, um, you know, certainly we, we have relationships with those folks, but this wasn't just the folks from TART dictating this. I mean, these were common threads we uniformly heard um, very long and loud at our three previous public input meetings. Right, but the 1947 agreement is not between the state and the I understand public. That. It's between the state and the city of Traverse City. I understand that. If, city, if the city wants to do something different, like, such as eliminate the trail, I mean, I guess that's something we could consider, but uh, that's definitely not what we heard. Commissioner Warner? To eliminate the trail, but we have a say over the project in general. Commissioner Warner, what you want, you're speaking about having public input, and they've gone over the meetings no, that they've speaking had about public input. The city input as well as the public, mm -hmm. and you've been told that these have been included in all these meetings. So what are you looking for from them? Well, no, I'm looking from our city, new city manager, and she has the unfortunate role of stepping in uh, to a very new project of what are the city goals with this project, um, who's representing the city, and where did the goals come from? And I don't expect to have an answer on the spot tonight, um, but we, we as an entity have not, it's not been shared with myself, certainly, as a city commissioner, what our goals are with this project and what's best for the city of Traverse City. With our half mile portion of it, not as the, we're not talking about the conversations that the at the 1947 larger. agreement only goes to the roundabout intersection. Right, the half mile there, right? Right, after that, MDOT gets to do what they wanna do. If they stick around. So, so I guess what I was asking is, and asking for clarification is we've had this conversation over the last year and a half as the west side that we're working on currently, wait, did I get the directions wrong? East side, sorry. And then the west side was brought up several times during it. So where do you feel like the fundamental difference was to help Liz answer some of these questions before our next meeting that we'd be discussing this? Uh, the fundamental difference is with the portion east of division, uh, I was treating, ra treated rather patronizingly, patted on the head, say, that's nice, we're glad somebody's trying to speak up for the common person, but you're too late. And so MDOT in there, I mean, it's, I would do the same thing in their shoes. They use the same approach, just proceed forward as they do with all communities in the state of Michigan that don't have a 1947 agreement. And I fully expect that we'll be told if there's anything we decide is a priority that it's too late, the project is too far along and they can't do it which again, I, I would do the same thing if I was in MDOT shoes. So it's, it's, our, it's our problem. I mean, we're the ones that created it because we did not speak up over the past two years since the portion east of division was moving forward. <coughs> but here we are, and I feel like we still have a responsibility to have a discussion with our public about best use of the Bayfront and what people would like to see there. Would you like to uh, clarify anything? Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little confused. If there have been a number of community input meetings, weren't those the meetings where the members of the public, the residents, as Commissioner Stanley attended those as a resident of Slaptown no. to share their concerns on what they meetings. would like to see? But they were, in, but it, the public was invited to those meetings. Completely different. Well, we, we, we didn't hold those meetings within the four walls of this building. They were very much open to the public. I, I think if, if you've picked up a paper in Traverse City in the last two years, you've been aware of this project. But we, we'd be here regardless of this 1947 agreement, no differently in the last one. Um, this project is a, a much more simplified project compared to the other project. There's no uh, uh, city-owned utility work that's being planned with this. There's not gonna be a detour. Cheryl explained how we're gonna maintain traffic through the corridor. Um, interested to hear what you have to say. I, I, think well, I agree, it is a more simplified project, which is all the more reason there could have been discussions, just as there were leading into the portion east of Division Street. There were ongoing meetings, lots of meetings about how it would proceed, what were the priorities of each, you know, MDOT, priorities of the city. And maybe that took place, but we as a body were not made aware of meetings like that for this particular project. I guess from, from my point of view, what, would, what exactly are you looking for from the city manager? Like what exactly are you looking for? 
uh, to, have, to have the city reach out to city residents and ask what they would like to see on their bayfront in this stretch. There's limited real estate. Like, do we want a median between east and westbound traffic that's that wide? Or would we ask MDOT to narrow that to two feet so there could be more parkland along the bayfront? That's just an example. But it's not like, oh, we need to do that. Just something for you to take a note of. Yeah, I can take a note yeah, of Yeah, there's that. Willow Creek that flows out under there. Um, and I know some residents have reached out to MDOT, and MDOT's been receptive, but we as a city have not talked about Willow Creek. Uh, we, we have a riparian buffer committee that uh, you know, cares all about water courses in the city. And here's a water course that's in a pipe for blocks and blocks and blocks. And here's an opportunity maybe to daylight it partly. Again, just an example. I'm not saying that the, I'm in favor of that, but share that with the public. Let the public know what this is a once in a hundred year sort of project. Um, if they have ideas and interests. Thank you for sharing the comments. So I see uh, the city manager taking Jerry's notes. So any other questions? Yes, Heather. Um, could you possibly blow up a map and explain if I were a pedestrian walking west along the Bay Street sidewalk and I wanted to get to Tom's West Bay, how is it going to work? And if I am a pedestrian walking on the other side of the street along the new shared tart pedestrian sidewalk, how am I going to get to Tom's West Bay? It's, it's a, I thought that the, it was confusing to see how, how I was going to cross all the way around. Sure. Um, I don't know if my screen is being shared with you all. Oh, I think so. Thank you all for bearing with us for a moment here. Yeah. <laughs> if not, maybe you just the commissioners have the in the in the packet that the public has on the website. There is that roll plot that you have, I believe, up on your screen. So. Yep. Um, uh, perhaps you can walk them through that, and I'll continue to try to get it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Could you please describe, I'm sorry, would you please describe the pathway you'd like to take? So pedestrians on both sides of the parkway yes. want to go to Tom's West Bay. Yes. Okay, so if you're on the land side of it, the neighborhood side of it, the existing trail in the green space, you would take that up to the approach um, where there is a pedestrian crossing of bay. So you would go west across, and I don't know if you can see the pedestrian markings, mm -hmm. but you would go west across bay, and then you would go north across M72. So I'm crossing, and then I'm walking along a median <coughs> in between north and south. Yep, the island, like the island is going to be a little bit wider than normal, and then it's a zigzag crossing. It's a crossing design that is being utilized um, when, when there's a hawk signal being used because traffic will be stopped. Um, if, you if you activate the hawk signal, you'll have a protected crosswalk for one bound, and then the median takes you a little bit further west to cross the, the westbound crossing at the Hawk signal there um, because we want the vehicles to get away from the roundabout before 
they stop again to um, for at a protected stop for a pedestrian to cross. And then I'm walking up some stairs to get to the no, sidewalk? No, those are, those are those enhanced markings. They, I, we call them piano keys. The pavement markings. <laughs> no, I know, but I mm -hmm. get so I get to the side. There's not the sidewalk is is up on uh, it. It's not connected to the. There's green space there between the crosswalk and the sidewalk. Yeah, I'll zoom in a little bit more. Oh, that would probably help. Oh, come on now. So that protected, I don't know if you can see my cursor, the, the special enhanced pavement uh, markings is where the crosswalk is. And then when you cross north um, to the Tom side, the sidewalk will continue to tie into the existing sidewalk. And the reason to move people along that island is because? If there's going to be back-to-back -back hawk signals, they're going to operate um, on separate push buttons, and the one uh, on the westbound uh, westbound side of M72 needs to be pulled farther away from the roundabout so that vehicles are done navigating the roundabout and they're looking for pedestrians. If you push it too close to the roundabout, a, a motorist is still navigating the roundabout, still completing the, the turn out of the roundabout, and probably is not going to be looking for pedestrians. So. What about if I'm on a bike and taking that same route? Yeah, it'll be wide enough to accommodate a bike, and, and even if you have a bike with a trailer. Mm -hmm. So I just use the pedestrian trail to, to take my bike to the Toms. Well, if you want to, there's another alternate route. If you're on the water side, you can take the trail all the way past M72, and there will be another pedestrian crossing um, a bit north <coughs> of the roundabout. And there's a, uh, where is mm -hmm. there we go. <coughs> okay. So, so there's another, and again, this will be protected with a hawk signal. If you wanted to avoid it's, the roundabout approaches. It seems super complicated, but. Um, and then you also have the additional bus stop in there, which th there is no bus stop there right now, right? Right now there's not, correct. <clears throat> um, so we've talked a lot about the uh, West End Beach. And from what I see in the plans, the parking is remaining alongside the, you know, right up against the highway or the parkway. Right, there, there are no changes to the parking. Oh. <clears throat> well, we've talked a lot about that and how, um, boy, we, it'd be nice to bring the, the trail onto the beach side and put the parking up against the, the parkway. So the trail is being shifted, and let's see if I can get this zoomed in. So the trail, we had it in a couple locations. We had it um, further uh, over into the parking area, um, but then it was shifted back into the green space uh, for fear that it was going to impact the parking. Well, we don't, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, I'm, you know, we were reducing parking in there. Uh, it's all about cars. It, this is this is a really tough place to get in and out of if you're if you're walking or you're biking because you have to cross the driveway <coughs> to the east and then you have to cross the driveway to the west. It's dangerous. Um, I know that we want to keep some parking in there, particularly um, barrier-free parking. But boy, it, it would be nice if you could come up with something that pushed the whole thing towards the beach side so that the parking's on the on the uh, parkway side and there so we're not crossing nobody has to deal with cars if if you're not ride, driving a car really quick question for I guess the city attorney or 
uh, Liz, we could totally eliminate parking from there if we wanted. That's ours to control, isn't it? That would be great. So that's that has to be down to the will of the commission. But we, when we had that discussion before, we said we wanted to keep handicapped accessible. Yes, sorry, correct. ADA accessible um, parking spots there. So that is our choice, and that is how we are designing. MDOT doesn't design that. That's us. Right, but we're creating a plan together here. Right. So if but we uh, if if we just allow for like six parking spots, we've got a lot more room to play around with here. And I'd like, I'd really like to see designs that just have six parking spots and a continuous flow for pedestrians and bikers. But, and just to clarify, so I'm right, there's no, this, whatever we do here is not going to impact the footprint of that lot, correct? Because you're doing the road part, we've got our footprint over there that we well, can do if we want. Well, who's building the trail, though? But that's what I'm saying, we, we designed that. So if we say we don't want this here anymore, we don't have it there anymore. Um, um, Mayor Shamro, the um, planning director <coughs> could speak to the parking lot because it's under review right now at the planning commission. He did, thank you. Yeah, Sean Winter, city planning director. I know the engineering department and the design team are working on that redesign right now. We had a meeting last week about it. Again, the parking lot is outside of MDOT's right away. So the trail that is going in in this project is in there right away. So we're talking mm -hmm. about you know, them doing what they want in their yard and then us doing what we want in our yard. So they're two separate things. We would like them to work together and they've been very accommodating through our accommodation or through our conversations throughout this. But by putting the trail on the non-water side, it keeps it within their right away, which is where they're authorized to do their work. So that's one of the reasons why it's there now. MDOT was aware of the conversations about this lot as they were planning this, and one of the main concerns that they heard was the sharing of the driveway with the vehicles, the pedestrians, and the bicyclists. So that's why on their own um, desire, I guess, if you will, or leadership decided to take that trail and put it in their project. It wasn't necessarily part of that. I'll go back to the previous question about the community's values because that came up. Um, Ms. Gregory pointed it out up there. They've been using our city adopted plans that represent our city values. So the 2010 Bayfront plan shows a trail on the water side going all the way up. Before that, if you were around, they had the Your Bay, Your Say mm -hmm. public in, uh, input session. Again, trail, waterfront, shift the parkway away from the water. So they've taken the planning documents that we have adopted, that we are working with, that we advocate for in our meetings with them, and have implemented those public projects. So, thank you, Sean. I'm not really sure where that ended up. So, the, the planning commission is looking at redesigning the parking lot. No, the planning commission doesn't design. They they just make recommendations and things like that. So, the engineering department is working on the design through cooperation with the design team, which are all the development-based departments in the city. So, fire was there last week giving information on the lane width that's necessary to get in there for rescues, things like that. But the planning commission, they don't they don't do the designs. That's the staff. Okay. Um one other problem I have, maybe two. Okay. Uh the wetlands at Tom's and that Bayview building, it looks like they're getting kind of eaten up. Um the I'd like just a few details about how, how the stormwater is expected to work in that roundabout, um, how this is affecting those wetlands, and you say there's a storage container there, but it's still going ultimately out into the bay, right? So we do have a storm a stormwater quality um, chamber, similar to the one the city installed down by the beach, and I am really fussing with this. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this one doesn't have the, dra the drainage on it. Um, one minute. Oh, this one doesn't show the drainage on this either. Um, the drainage uh, network isn't shown right here. Um, but yes, there is some grading. You noted the, the wetland area is the retention basin in front of Tom's. Um, we did work with Tom's on multiple occasions to talk through, and, and this, this design that you see right now 
uh, shows the minimal amount of disturbance to that area, and we, we could not impact the volume of the ret their retention. So we changed our grading plan to make sure that none of their retention was jeopardized. Um, and also retains as much of their landscape as possible. And I think the agreement that MDOT real estate folks have with them is to um, restore any, drain, any landscaping that's disturbed. And then the stormwater chamber will actually be located, um, there's a, a confluence of three different uh, drainage networks in this area. Um, the drainage, the chamber will be right here in the middle of the roundabout, um, which will allow maintenance vehicles to pull off into the roundabout for maintenance purposes, um, treat the stormwater before outletting it to the bay. And there's no pedestrian access to that round, to the no, center of that roundabout, no, right? No, no, no. Um, so th the green space between Bay Street and the Parkway you're, you say that you're um, shrinking that down by five feet. Correct. Is that correct? There, there are a number of large trees in there. They do serve the purpose of protecting those neighborhoods from the noise of the parkway. Um, there is no median. Once you get past the Holiday Inn, it's all median-free for ever and ever. It, it, uh, I don't know how the rest of you feel about maybe sacrificing the median to keep more green space on the bay side and protecting that that tree barrier that softens the noise and the traffic fumes. I I am supportive of that in concept. I would, I would like to hear more about that possibility of either a reduction or an elimination of the, uh, the median. The existing median. Um, I can speak to it from a safety perspective as well as um, a potential for aesthetic improvements. But from a safety perspective, um, what we see along this bay, because it is such a scenic route, um, I'll use the example of a project um, to the east uh, on US 31 um, that we were just, we just widened it a smidge and put in a raised, like a, an extra wide rumble strip in a raised island um, because of the fatalities in that corridor. So um, that's probably the, the single most reason to retain the, the median barrier through this area. It's a very scenic area. There are distractions. Um, keeping a positive barrier um, with curb and gutter is a safety, pr safety procedure. Two things, one, it's a physical barrier. The second thing is, it's a geometric feature that naturally encourages slower driving. When you have uh, five lanes of pavement, or we don't design four lane pavements anymore if we can avoid it, um, a five lane pavement um, tends to encourage speeders. So um, that would be a safety reason why we would recommend keeping the median raised island. It also facilitates the pedestrian refuge at Elmwood. How wide is that one to the east you're referencing? Um, I would have to, what did, we ended up doing six foot, we had zero, and so we were able to get six foot of um, extra wide raised um, rumble strip, which I think would not be popular for the Slab Town residents. All right, this isn't really a comment for MDOT, but it's like appropriate for the discussion of noise and maybe a follow-up I can't recall if Miss Vogel was city manager yet when um, we looked into the issue with engine braking through that area and whether or not we're um, on top of enforcing our own ordinances in that regard because um, those were comments before that when the semis come through the brakes yeah I might be able to speak to that one we get this question a lot. Um, it's, uh, and I can share with you some information that I just recently downloaded from the Michigan State Police website. My understanding is it's virtually impossible for them to enforce um, whether or not somebody driving a truck is simply letting <coughs> foot off the accelerator or whether or not they're actually jig braking as the term goes. It doesn't violate the uh, Michigan Vehicle Code to do that. So unfortunately, a lot of communities are left to try and enforce it under the terms of their noise ordinance, which is virtually impossible to do. So um, 
it's, it's been our experience and the thing that I typically tell my community partners when this question comes up is it's usually a small number of people that are, um, you know, one community that comes to mind, they have a mm -hmm. logging company just outside of the municipal limits and it was this one particular logging company's uh, drivers that were doing it repetitively and uh, they scheduled a sit down with them, they sat down and talked about it and the, the, the jake breaking decreased um, substantially overnight. So um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to enforce, so. Will this new material help that at all? Well, the new material is, is tremendously gonna, going to help the noise, but something that we've definitely found here over the, the last few years is, um, it, it's no secret, there's a lot of gravel production just west of Traverse City out in the M72 corridor. A lot of those producers are now hauling down county roads to US 31 and uh, say down Lake by the uh, Platte River Fish Hatchery and then coming up 31 to Interlochen. And um, we actually did a project down there a few years ago and we actually uh, redesigned a particular intersection that they go through a lot because they were having trouble. So I know that uh, there's been less and less um, bulk material hauling through the city as a result of the population growth in the area. So. Well, just to go, go ahead. If you I was just about to say, you, you, you're saying as we grow, they'll start wanting to go around? They have. They absolutely have, yeah, because of the congestion in town. And, and things like the roundabout, trying to, you know, traffic calm, slow folks down, um, but, but keep traffic moving safely, so. We could go to a two-way highway uh, along the parkway, and then we wouldn't have, <laughs> nobody want it truck their stuff For half through. a mile. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still concerned about the green space between the parkway and uh, the and Bay Street. I, I see in some of the plans that it's being used as a work area. Uh, it, it looks like you're gonna lose all those trees. I just, I wish that maybe you could look at reducing the median to the smallest, safest uh, width. Maybe there's something you can either, uh, there's some kind of something that can stick in there that uh, would, you know, provide more visual safety or there's landscaping that could go in there that would provide to keep as much of that green space between the parkway and Bay Street. I, I do want to let you all know that the landscaping plan is not finalized. Um, we'll definitely be talking with the city about the types of landscaping and hardscape amenities that are going to go along the route, not just up by where the bus stops are, but also down in the green spaces. And that's still a work in progress. We haven't finalized that yet. Thank you. At what, or no question I have, at what point, as we're getting updates and was mentioned, you know, we've had some different ones here and there, um, but had some interruptions too, due to scheduling. Um, you know, I appreciate this one that we have here with the kind of envisioned lines on it. Is there any kind of, for the future, or is it what point in the process in the future, do we get kind of a more, um, I, I don't know, it would be like the, uh, the design of how it will look without it just being superimposed on the top so that maybe we can get better visuals on some of these safety features and the crossings and things like that. So the actual kind of, um, I can't think of any word right now. Blueprint, but not blueprint of, like, like a photo, of what it'll like a actually look like. Image, like a yeah, virtual image. imaging. We haven't you. prepared those yet, but I'll certainly ask Dan if there's a few key locations that that would be helpful. I just for, think, yeah, I think that'll, I've seen some like what's envisioned here, but if people haven't, I can see how maybe that might help people um, see a little bit more of what's being proposed as well too for the public. Other questions right now? Okay, seeing none. Um, at this time, we have we don't usually do we don't always do comments on every agenda item in a in a study session, but um, just because we have a lot of bigger items on this one, I'm going to allow it. Does anyone have any public comment on this item of the Grandview Parkway? And if you wanna, we'll we'll have let people come up to the podium and have them. Okay. And for uh, tonight's public comment, uh, for anyone speaking, please uh, state your name and address, indicate if you're a city resident, non-city resident, or city business mm -hmm. owner. Uh, when we have three minutes uh, allotted for each speaker. When your time has elapsed, a timer will beep, and we ask that all language be respectful to everyone. Thank you. Hi, Mayor Quillman, 517 3rd Street. I uh, represent the Slabtown Neighbors Neighborhood Association as the Vice President. I just want to say thank you to MDOT for 
being uh, willing, letting us be uh, participate in their meetings and for taking our surveys and our thoughts. Uh, we would like to let the, I'm here for the president, uh, who had a comment that he wants to make sure that with these changes that we, uh, with the extra traffic that's gonna be taking place on Bay and Monroe, that we, um, that we use city resources or uh, consider planning to make sure that we um, allocate sources for more trucks and more uh, vehicles that'll be coming down there. And I'm very much looking, uh, happy with what's going on with the waste spot, with the stormwater runoff and looking forward to the wonderful changes that'll be happening soon. Thank you. Doug Kimball, 523 North Spruce Street, Traverse City. So first, uh, review and repeat for me. I look at the trail, breakfast, lunch, dinner, when I'm on the computer, when I'm working in the yard, when I'm shoveling snow. The trail's right there, so I see what's going on on the trail. The trail is, has light use most of the year. Of course, uh, tourist season, everything changes. But, but really, there's very, it's light use for, for the majority of the year. Um, and, you know, it, so this is a win for the tourists. They're going to get a wider trail, and we're going to lose because we get the heavy, noisy truck traffic brought closer to us. So um, that's, that's, I don't want it brought closer to us. And, you know, okay, there's noise reduction in the, in the roadway, but it's closer. So is it really going to help? I don't know. Um, and I'm not a trail opponent. I donate to it. I've donated to it for years. I used it to get here tonight. So it's not that I'm against the trail, but it's a win for the tourists, a loss for our neighborhood. I've talked to lots of people in the neighborhood. They don't want it. You know, it's the noise. It's the grime. It's referred to as a truck route, not a parkway, a truck route or a dragway, you know. And um, that's, that's my main thing. For us, it's a win for the tourists, three or four months a year. It's a loss for us every day forever. You know, that'll be closer to us every day forever. Every day forever. We're going to have to put up with the, the, the noise of the trucks, especially. Uh, I think that was it. How much time do I have? 50 seconds. 15? 5-0. Five 5-0. Zero. Five zero. Uh, let's see. Did they give you I'm extra time last time? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did, well, have I made myself clear? Okay. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> James Palmer, resident in Garfield Township, uh, property owner in the city at 1349 Division. Um, moving the parkway, I don't know if it was five feet, what, what the number was. It was a small number of feet. Uh, yes, it gets a little bit closer, but with the way the noise works, I'm not sure five feet is really gonna add to a noticeable decibel level. And I guess I would challenge anybody to say, stand 100 feet from the roadway with a decibel meter and then step five feet or if it's eight feet closer and see if that even changes. I don't think that's gonna make a difference. Uh, even the trees don't absorb sound in the way that we sometimes think they do. And there's been studies done on that. Uh, really what we need, and I would love to have less traffic in the city. Sir, please uh, direct your comments this way. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry. Uh, I think all of us would love to have less traffic running through the city, and until the county and MDOT can get some sort of more of a bypass that we don't have to drive through the city, we're going to continue to have that problem. Hopefully one day we'll have that where people can traverse around Traverse City and not have to drive through for every mode of business transportation. So, thank you. Just read 63, Cottage Drive, Permit 1B, Traverse City Resident. Um, I'd like to say that with this design, it is not the final design, this is a draft, meaning that um, they can tweak things here and there. Um, and they even said that they're not um, finishing with landscaping yet, and that's another thing to be looking at. So, um, I would rather have smooth pavement and not cracked pavement 
and concrete, asphalt, and all of that would make a difference. Um, and they also said that they've done a lot of community output and input um, with this. There's, they've had meetings with the community with this. So if I'm a person that attends these meetings, what's the difference from me attending a meeting that MDOT is doing I mean, attending a meeting here at the city commission, there isn't. Um, so, if MDI is saying from their outreach of residents who live in Slab Town, which you know Slab Town's a lot closer to 31 M72, and if most of those residents have said, "Hey, we want this," um, I don't see what the argument is, um, and from what the draft looks like, it looks awesome. Um, and it gives more, um, it gives more resources in the community that use that chart trail a whole lot. Um, and so um, regardless, something has to be done with that part of M72 and M22 um, just because it needs to be redone. And trying to delay it and nitpicking it, well, that's not going to go anywhere. And it's just going to cost, drive that expense even more and more and more. And instead of saying, okay, let's do this now, let's get it done, instead of nitpicking every single little thing. Um, and I think they've done a great job with the reconstruction so far at the 31 between Garfield and the Del Mar. Um, so far we've only had one incident with a bike and that's been it. So it hasn't been the end of the world. Um, so I think once it gets done and the asphalt's down and everything else is good with it, that nobody will complain about it and you don't have to worry about utilities for the next 30 years. So thank you. Any further public comment? on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, any last questions from the commission of this or any staff? If I okay. could just give you a real quick update. Uh, in your packets, I provided a copy of our current five-year plan. Um, there's really just two projects I just kind of wanted to bring to your attention. One, um, we've been working with the folks at the uh, Traverse City State Park at the intersection of uh, Three Mile and US 31. We're planning to put um, a second um, westbound to southbound turn lane in there and align their entrance into the park with that three mile road intersection that is offset right now. It causes a lot of confusion, it's very dangerous. Um, the traffic backups there have been horrendous and uh, so that was uh, some money that we were able to get through uh, some operations funding. And then the only other project that we really have coming up is in 2025, we're picking up uh, the work on US 31 south of town, um, west of Chum's Corners by the uh, the old cherry growers, I guess, go-go squeeze plant now. And we're basically going to continue that same cross-section up to the interlocking corners where we plan to put in a roundabout. Mm. Um, and then uh, we're going to construct that as far west as we can to uh, Reynolds Road. Um, the budget on that one is getting a little <coughs> tight. but uh, <laughs> So it's a pretty exciting project. And that is pretty much the last thing we have planned uh, in the immediate uh, area. Traverse City. We've got a pretty exciting project plan for 2027 down in Manistee. So. Great. Well, with that, either I just had one question for you. Um, so, uh, and you had mentioned, I believe, when we met, um, I think a month ago with the staff, that um, landscaping was still in progress. And you just recently uh, had the public input session in Elmwood Township last week. So, are there any soft or hard deadlines that I should be aware of in terms of final tweaks to different aspects of this plan? And I I'll turn it over to Cheryl to provide you a crisp answer, but on the landscape plan on the prior project, what we had suggested is that we would do whatever the city uh, really uh, had in mind. And I know Lucas has been talking to uh, your Parks and Recs Director about some thoughts on landscaping. Uh, the center island of the roundabout is another great opportunity to do some creative landscaping. It just has to be something kind of low. Um, so if the city had any thoughts or even themes, um, you know, that's something that uh, the project is not too far along for us to incorporate. But I'll let Cheryl talk about our next milestone plan turn and date, which is coming up next week. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, but we have about we have about six more weeks to finalize landscaping. 
Um, we have a draft of the landscaping ideas based on what was uh, being proposed to the east. Um, but yeah, there is still time to make some tweaks to that, particularly as Dan mentioned for the roundabout. It, it could be, um, it, we want it to be attractive, but not, a, not, but not a public nuisance, not so that it attracts people to walk into the median. So um, nothing, nothing with text or print, something that might attract someone to, to try to read it and go into the median, but certainly landscaping, um, flowers, what have you. Uh, we're absolutely open to that, and we'll meet with the city for that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, and I uh, look forward to hearing more about your conversations with the city. Thank you. We'll let them clear out here as we move into our discussion on parking services. And so I will hand that off to you again, Liz. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Mayor Shamro. Um, and we do have um, our Human Resources Director, Christine Bosley, here. She's outlined um, our intentions to explore the transition of parking services back to the city, um, which would result in exiting agreement, which provides for the Downtown Development Authority to manage parking services. Um, this sort of came about as the transition um, from the previous CEO of the Downtown Development Authority um, as she was exiting, she brought it to our attention that we had an old agreement that should probably be reviewed and looked at, um, and uh, the DDA is in the process of doing a search for a new CEO. Uh, we are currently working on our budget and union contracts, and so it seemed like a reasonable time to investigate the feasibility of, of that. I just want to make a note that all the city parking assets belong to the city. Uh, the city pays for parking, and then the DDA manages it. So um, in terms of relative cost increase, we've been asked that question. It would be transitioning staff into uh, our um, unions, into our classifications, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, Ms. Bosley can speak to that more, more clearly. But at this point, I think I would want to turn it over to her if um, you have any very specific questions about sort of how we've gotten to this point. Um, currently, there's 14 personnel for the DDA. Four of them are um, supervisors, so um, hypothetically, if they were to come over to the city, um, I mean, we do pay 100% of the personnel cost as it is now. Um, four of the supervisors would come to the non-represented uh, management side, and then um, the other 10 employees would go, would be split between the general, uh, general municipal employees over at DPS and then a portion, uh, the customer service would be uh, put under the uh, general municipal clerical technical group. And so um, next week we'll be presenting um, our negotiated contracts uh, summary, so we're super excited about that. Um, but the only difference, I said the only three differences that we have currently for the DDA for benefits um, is our MERS defined benefit plan. They don't get that. Um, and that's about an 8.5% cost increase of their wages. Um, and then we also provide a MERS healthcare savings plan. That's for the retirement um, health insurance. Um, that would be 2%, and that's everything that, that's um, a benefit that's citywide for all employees. Um, but then there would be a decrease to their um, defined contribution plan they get 10%, DDA employees get 10%, um, but the bargaining units, they get six. So that would be a slight, slight decrease. Does anyone have questions right now about this? Go ahead, Jackie. I, I have questions where we're addressing issues that seem like a presumed close, you know, that yes, this is gonna happen and this is gonna be the impact on the current employees. I'm not quite at that stage yet, sure. and perhaps there's going to be some pre-conversation, but um, I, I would like to hear more about the financial ramifications of this decision. Um, I would like to hear more about what benefits to residents are expected from taking parking services back under, under the wing of, of the city. Um, I 
was very concerned. I went through some um, financial statements that were reviewed at the uh, oh, Mobility and Parking uh, Advisory Board meeting back on February 7th, and it looks to me like um, because certain expenses were not reflected in this financial analysis that um, rather than being in the, in the, in the black for, uh, for the current fiscal year that um, parking services actually may be um, $328,000 in the red uh, projected by June 30th. So I, I'm looking at this kind of like a business acquisition and wondering what are, what are we getting? What are the benefits? What are the costs? And I, I'd like to know when we'll have a conversation about that as opposed to what happens to the employees when. So I just want to say, um, Commissioner Anderson, there's been no assumption on the part of staff or administration that we are, that this is going to happen. We've been looked into investigate it, like you said. How, how would those nuts and bolts pieces work? How would we manage it? Who would report to who? And, and as we are running numbers right now, we know that there are going to be some increased costs in the MERS DB, and we know that there's going to be decreased costs in the defined contribution. Um, specifically, how those numbers are, what that exact final figure is for like a July 1, we're still putting that together. That was, this is that first conversation, public conversation about what this would look like and how we would, would do it. So there's no, there's no assumption being made by anyone on the staff. It appears from the numbers that were reviewed in February that there's plenty of data available to be able to make an informed assessment of whether this is a step that we want to take. And I'd like to know when, when that conversation will happen. We're running out of fiscal year, aren't we? <laughs> um, and nothing has to necessarily align with the fiscal year. We're sure we like to budget for the fiscal year, but even if we were to put a full transition budgeted for July 1, in, and again, I'm not making any assumptions, I'm just offering that by way of example, that doesn't mean that on July 1, everything's gonna like flip like a light switch. So that, those would be further conversations down the road. Um, and I would lean on this commission to, to tell me if you would like another uh, study session, if you'd like hard numbers, um, I would have to, again, we've been doing union negotiations, and so we've been trying to, to juggle a lot of these things. This was a good time for us to look at it. It made a lot of sense to do it right now. Um, so if you'd like us to come back at a, a future meeting, uh, and again, we're also working on those budget figures. Uh, the budget is due to the commission for May 6th. So um, all of those things are in progress. I would be interested in both of those things, a further study session as well as a financial analysis of the proposal. I'd like to see us looking at uh, how we're accounting for depreciation on the parking decks for this, this fiscal year. I'd like to see why there are no fees being paid to the city from parking, rev parking meter revenue for apparently through the end of this fiscal year. Um, so I, I, there are some inconsistencies and, and holes in this financial summary that make me, um, if, I were, if I were buying this as a business, I think I would decline. So I'd like to, I'd like to hear more okay. soon. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Um, I just wanna make sure for the commission and the public that you understand that we're not buying back parking. I the understand city already, that. All of we the assets, it. the parking it. fund, everything already belongs to the city. It is except a metaphor, the employee. including the employee. I want to make sure that. Thank you. I'm right. Using so that as the a public metaphor. understands yes. it's not taking on a liability. It's an entire department that already is within the city. Well understood. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. The yeah. So depreciation, so, all that is already under us. I'm a little disappointed. I no. thought that that's what this meeting was for, was to have this conversation yeah, now. Too. Mm -hmm. And some of the points you made actually, to me, seems like a reason for us to re retain control over citywide parking, not just downtown. That, that may very well be the case, but let's talk about the benefits to residents as well as the costs. Tim, go ahead. Well, I agree with both points of view because, I, yeah, I feel like we do need to understand the financial health mm -hmm. of parking services, whatever that report looks like. But as pointed out, in the end, it's ours. 
Um, and so the sooner we can understand that financial health, work with city manager and staff to find a path forward, uh, the better. So again, I agree with my colleagues uh, completely. I, w I would agree as well. I think part of it too was, as was said, nothing was predetermined about this. This was a time to bring up the conversation. If this had been brought up and everyone up here said, absolutely not, then we probably wouldn't ask them to bring back this extra data and such. So I think that's perfectly reasonable for us to say, let's, let's see the, the numbers here and then see how this would work uh, as far as um, getting into more of that detail versus, um, well, just seeing the, basically what will be in the budget anyway, what would be in the budget anyways if this were to proceed forward. So thank you for that. Any other questions from commissioners at this time? We'll be bringing it back. How soon could we see it back in? Um, we have a study session April 22nd. <coughs> okay, there we go. And any questions for, or any public comment from the public on this? Seeing none. We will move on to our next item, which is an overview of the QRT. I'll have you kick that off, Liz. Thank you, Mayor Shamro. Um, so this evening, we've got a number of invited guests who've been uh, welcomed here to talk a little bit about what they do. And uh, they're invited to answer the question, what would you like to see um, or, or what kinds of things um, would you like to see uh, for this summer season as we prepare, the city staff prepares um, for the Pines. Uh, this evening we have our police chief, Matt Richmond here, our social police social worker, Jennifer Holm. We have a representative <coughs> from the street outreach team. Um, we have Roger um, Gersel and Lauren Van Hull um, from the street medicine representatives, community mental health crisis mobile representative, Brad Neuter, Neuter, sorry, I'm, I'm German, I was like Neuter. And um, we also have Paula Lipinski here. And I wanna say thank you very much for coming and taking the time out of, out of your days. Um, you do incredible work for the community. You are the subject matter experts in these fields and we are really um, thankful for you being able to attend this evening. Uh, and before um, I would turn it over, I just wanna say that um, as we do the budgeting process and as I've been here approximately 95 days and listened and learned and and, and heard about all the, the concerns in the Pines. Um, I am working on some solutions through the budgeting process. This budget has not been presented to the Board of Commissioners yet, um, but our, our police chief has asked for an additional community officer. I will be recommending an additional community officer uh, and a second police department social worker. I think that these are things that are working in our community. That's the feedback that we're receiving from our businesses uh, and our residents that this extra um, community officer uh, is, is a benefit. Um, we've also received a uh, request from our North Boardman uh, Novo uh, Business District for garbage cans. Uh, so I'm working on budgeting that into our next contract with GFL. And additionally, our city attorney took the initiative um, to bring back the community court. So she's been working with our local uh, judges and that also would require some budgeting to make that happen. We know that their community court works. It helps with recidivism. And so those are the things right now that we've been working on behind the scenes. I am planning on presenting all of the things that we've been talking about in the future. Um, I have a, a few things on my to-do list in April and in May, but this will be coming in the next few weeks. Um, the staff, the team, uh, the stakeholders, I am in regular meetings with all of them. So I look forward to reporting back out and it'll probably be, um, hopefully it's a May 6th meeting since a lot of these things align with the budget that would make a lot of sense to to do it then. But at this time, if I um, could welcome, I don't Chief Richmond, if you'd like to come up and say a few words and then introduce um, Jennifer, please. Good evening, Matt Richmond, uh, Chief of Police for Traverse City Police Department. And just a quick note, uh, I wanna say thank you for letting us present tonight. And today was one of our Pines cleanup day and there was approximately 35 volunteers along with city staff there to help clean up the pines. I wanna say thank you to all those volunteers. And Saturday, there was kind of a pre-pines cleanup, uh, serving up love. Robin headed that up and 
There was approximately 35 volunteers at that one as well. They did a lot of cleanup, which allowed us to get to areas that we normally don't because it takes us that much time throughout the day to do that cleanup. Uh, and last count I had from city parks is that um, there was three garbage trucks worth of trash that were removed from the pines today. So thank you to the volunteers with our dedicated NOBO officer now in place. Hopefully this is a good start going forward into the summer that we can keep um, you know, tabs on the pines, regulate behavior, enforce some of those um, ordinances that we've agreed upon with the city attorney to enforce so that we can keep this in an orderly fashion. Um, one other thing that I wanna take just a few minutes to um, highlight I know that the question, what can we do better at the Pines or what can we do going forward in the summer is gonna be asked. I want to acknowledge the projects that we've been doing over the last several years for this area. Um, through numerous city of staffs, uh, community service providers and um, you know, countless volunteers. So just to run down a, a quick list of this, we've created a fire lane into the center of the pine so that we can get emergency vehicles back in there if need be for medical assistance or potential to combat wildfires. We've added GPS located waypoint signs throughout uh, the men's trail, which is south of uh, 11th Street there. This was uh, assisted with Grand Traverse County Central Dispatch. This allows for first responders that respond into the pines to notify central dispatch where we are. Uh, they can pinpoint right exactly where we are for other responding officers. It also gives a point uh, for anyone that calls 911. If they're near one of these signs, they can, they can say I'm at E3 and we know exactly where to go for that. Um, Men's Trail was added to the list of parks that bans alcohol completely. This is not something that we enforce every single day, but it's something that we have as a tool to enforce and change behavior if that is what's causing some of that behavior that we run into. Uh, we've added fences and no parking signs to the paved area where the dumpsters get. Before we were getting cars that would park up in there, either people would be living in there or we've had uh, individuals that go up there and sell narcotics out of that. They would park there, individuals would come out of the pines. So. That's something that we've tried to do to prevent that. We've been, begun the process of trimming low hanging branches and clearing overgrown vegetation. This is the safety issue that some of our officers and first responders uh, indicated. You know, it gets very dense back in there and if we're responding, especially in the middle of the night, uh, it's a safety issue. And so if we can see further out, that benefits us. It also benefits the community if they're walking by or those individuals living within the pines. If they can see a threat coming from further away, they have more time to react and address that threat. Um, we're in the process of installing new signs at the trailheads, listing those ordinances that we may be enforcing throughout the summer. Uh, this gives individuals a warning and they, they know what to expect. And then through our community service provider, we give them a message and they every time they go out in the pines, they're enforcing that as well. We've added street lights along the walking trail on the south end of the pines. This is also a safe route for kids to school. So we, TC Light and Power, put a street light on every light pole from Division to Elmwood. We've purchased cam cameras to be installed overlooking the walking trail and the dumpster. Uh, and we hold biannual pines cleanup like I uh, addressed, you know, spoke to earlier. We've added a community policing officer earlier in 2022, uh, the no North Boardman community policing officer along with our police social worker. These were grant funded positions to deal with issues uh, surrounding the homeless population um, and to address calls for service in Hall Park, uh, the Boardman area and the, and the library. We've also, uh, worked with Jubilee House, Central United Methodist Church in Safe Harbor during that time to provide day shelter to alleviate some of those pressures that those, uh, those areas were seeing. So those are some of the same things that we're gonna try to do on the west side of the city uh, through the Pines. And just to acknowledge, you know, city staff has worked very hard on this over the last two, two years. So 
the manager's office, the city attorney's office, the fire department, city parks, city GIS, the police department, commissioners, central dispatch, GFL services, they are picking up trash out of the dumpster free of charge. They do that several times a week. The QRT and its 50 partnerships, community service providers within our town, and the countless volunteers. So if I ask you of one thing that we can do better or we can continue as going forward, I ask the commission to support expanding these efforts and implementing the necessary resources needed to accomplish the ideas and tasks that come from <coughs> asking what can we do better in the pines. So with that, I w I'm going to turn this over to Jen Holm. Uh, Jen Holm is our police social worker. Uh, she was hired in 2022 along with that community policing officer. Uh, the program initially was to uh, implement naloxone into our community and also respond to overdose, yeah, overdose, overdoses um, within our community. Since that time, she has taken this program to the next level. We currently have 50 partnerships within our community that respond to the needs of our vulnerable population, which consists of two or more homelessness, mental health, or substance use disorder. So with that, she'll explain it much more eloquently than I would. Jen Holm. Thank you so much for having me and having us commissioners. Really appreciate being here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little overview about the QRT, and then I have some partners uh, that I will introduce who will speak briefly about their role and how we support the people uh, who are residing in the Pines as well as the community. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, I know the question will be brought up. So while we were talking about the Pines cleanup, um, the question was brought up during the cleanup in terms of um, how has there been this much trash accumulated since the last Pines cleanup? And I think a, a valuable part to be able to do, uh, to thank is the, the group who was out on Saturday, uh, in addition to our Pines cleanup that happened today. Um, it took what usually is a three to four hour cleanup and combine that with an all day cleanup. So we've essentially had 12 to 15 hours of cleaning up the pines. Um, and if you go back there, I guarantee it looks different than the last time you were there. I, I hope that that's a good thing for our, for our city. Okay, on to the QRT. <laughs> this is what I'm actually good at talking about. All right. Uh, so the quick response team uh, was a grant funded initiative that uh, was designed to uh, provide an overdose response team, and then also get naloxone or Narcan into our community and respond to overdoses. It's blossomed into something much bigger than that. Uh, we have a prevention focus with our program, uh, and individuals can actually be a part of it before they ever overdose, and maybe even if they're not at risk for overdose. The literature on that states that 50% of people with a mental health disorder will eventually have a substance use disorder at some point in their lifetime, and the reverse is true as well. And anywhere between 30 and 70% of folks experiencing homelessness have co-occurring disorders of mental health and substance use. That is how we built our program. It is a, uh, a voluntary program, so if people don't want to participate, they can opt out at any time. And uh, our goal is to reduce law enforcement calls for the vulnerable people who are in our community uh, by interrupting the cycle of arrest and addiction. So eligibility refers to experiencing at least two out of three crises related to substance use, homelessness, and mental health, as well as residing within the city limits. Um, so this is directly uh, within the commissioner's territory. We have had 275 referrals for service. We have had 205 of those eligible referrals, and 146 people have, have elected to become program participants. So about 150 people have chosen to be a part of our program, with over 200 uh, in total being, being eligible for the program. Um, I currently carry a caseload of about 110 at any given time, uh, and so capacity is definitely a concern. As we continue to talk about what we can do better, uh, I, I, I am grateful to be able to talk about the QRT and if um, additional efforts would be able to be a part of that, that'd be great. Uh, for the 205 eligible referrals, there's a combined history of 8,238 law enforcement reports written on them. That includes arrests, trespasses, and any documented assists prior to their referral. 
So prior to them being referred, there was over 8,000 total reports written on folks who have been referred to the QRT. We are definitely targeting some of the most vulnerable people in our community. So with that, what, what do we actually do? <laughs> any agency, so we do have 50 partners, any agency um, and any person can refer somebody to the QRT if they're eligible, if they think they might be eligible. We see if they're interested. If they're not, that's okay. They can elect out of the program and we just, you know, they're just not a part of it. They can change their mind anytime within six months uh, before we close their case. And if that were to happen, we could open another case later. Um, if they are interested, we fill out paperwork with them for the program. And that paperwork has a sharing component to it in which we have primary and secondary QRT partners. Primary partners include our Northwest Coalition to End Homelessness, homelessness specifically with Goodwill Northern Michigan, Safe Harbor, Northwest Michigan Support of Housing. We have the um, Community Mental Health, as well as Addiction Treatment Services and the Traverse Health Clinic and the Jail Social Worker, specifically. Those seven agencies are the primary team. We actually go through and we talk about each person who has been um, a part of and referred for the QRT in terms of their status, how we can follow up with them and what they need. We also have these additional partners that we call secondary partners. They have not a formal MOU with us, like our primary partners, but they do have a partnership agreement where they can refer and we can bring them in as needed. These are folks that when we tell people you're gonna be a part of the QRT, we say, and as you need additional resources like employment or dental, we can bring in these partners and then you can have them as part of your support system. Essentially what we're doing, what we're doing is we're building a web. We're building a huge supportive web for these people because um, in, in previous work we've found that you know sometimes through various laws that were designed to protect people like HIPAA and 42 CFR, ultimately the person loses because providers can't talk with each other and share information. That limits the person's ability to get support from multiple avenues. With this sharing agreement, multiple partners can be involved and we kind of build this as it goes. So in terms of the referral process, uh, when we follow up with them, they, we try to connect them with whatever agencies might help meet their needs and we kind of think outside the box. If that is treatment, great. If that is harm reduction, fantastic. If that is something we wouldn't have maybe thought of, like volunteering or employment, we try to also include those as part of the solution, knowing that meaningful daily activities sometimes help to encourage people. Um, that is the follow-up that we do. Per our policy, uh, we follow up every three months. The goal would be to follow up every two months, and that was something we were able to do when uh, the caseload was smaller. But of course, as we are expanding, we are only able to meet our policy guidelines. So people don't always know my face, um, and they don't always know my name right away because I'm only seeing them every three months. But what they do know is our partners, um, and we're super, super grateful to have four of them coming up and kind of talking with you today. Uh, but our partners really make this work. The reason the QRT works is not because of one person. Uh, the department has been super on board with having a social worker, very grateful for that. Um, but it is the combination of the department and our community, community partners who are doing this boots on the ground work and every day interacting with our folks. And they have appointments for medical. They go out into the community for, for um, street med and street outreach and we're getting housing for folks and we're doing these things that are solving the problems that our community faces. So while I'd love to take all the credit for that, it's not me. Uh, and, and I think it really is the team of, of providers that we do have working together for that. So with coordination of care, um, the crux of the QRT is these 50 partners. Uh, participants are given a support system web that basically take out the barriers to their care. So we're all coordinating and talking about their care. If someone, so we had someone who um, is, is going to be getting housing, but there's maybe a gap in that time. What can we offer that person that makes that gap um, more bearable for them and so that they might be less vulnerable and kind of help that transition into housing, right? Uh, we want to make sure, you know, if people need support when they are um, getting treatment, if they need additional resources, that's kind of what we do. We have tri-weekly meetings uh, where we discuss what we lovingly call potholes in the community. Uh, and uh, that is for gaps in service provision between agencies, things that just aren't working in the community. Some things we can do something about right away. Other things take wide level advocacy. And so we meet and we talk and you know, we, we encourage additional recommendations from there. 
we also do the overdose response component. So within 72 hours of an overdose, we do go out and we meet with all overdoses, overdose victims or their support systems within the city, um, and we try to get them resources, whatever best fits the situation. That response is with myself, an officer, a member from addiction treatment services, and a peer recovery coach. And we say that last one generally because we use the person who best fits the response. If it is a suicide attempt that caused the overdose, for example, we might take a mental health professional who's a peer recovery coach, um, and we just try to have <coughs> it fit the situation the best that it can. Not everybody wants to talk about treatment, so having options for harm reduction and other philosophies is also really helpful to that. So what we don't do um, is crisis response. We leave that to our mobile crisis, uh, and that is because um, the caseload, we try to take it back from each individual crisis that somebody's experiencing and actually track the person and try to make that person's experience a little bit better. Um, also case management, so I'm not a case manager, um, but more of a referral source. I'm sort of the hub, so I get information about our partners, I'm sorry, about our participants, and then I pass that along to our partners and to the people who are doing that direct care. So if our partners uh, who are speaking would like to come up, um, how we serve the Pines. We have 88% of our individuals who are in the QRT who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so that is 180 of the 205 eligible individuals who are currently experiencing crises related to homelessness. I guess currently is not fair. At the time of their referral, we're experiencing crises related to homelessness. Um, we have had several people housed, and I'm grateful for that. I don't have a housing tree, and so again, that is the work of our partners who are doing that. Follow-up is done in the Pines. Uh, it's also done at other spots, regularly engaged uh, from the residents of the Pines, like the community meals that are provided, for example, throughout the city. Uh, in our vulnerable, with our vulner, vulnerable community members. The police also now have direct connections with street outreach, who we, try, who we work with for a trauma-informed approach to enforcement, as well as community events like the Pines Cleanup, and they also have direct connections to CMH and ATS. So it's hopefully making their response more trauma-informed and better overall for the people that we are uh, interacting with. Okay, guys, please come up. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to introduce our partners. Uh, street Medicine is going to be first. We have Roger Gersel and Bree Sika. They're going to talk about Street Medicine, which is an a multidisciplinary health initiative from the Travers Health Clinic and Munson Healthcare, uh, in which they partner to go directly where people are experiencing homelessness to connect them with medical care. Uh, they work <coughs> alongside Street Outreach, who will go last, and go into the Pines weekly to provide care to individuals right in their tents, in addition to having a mobile medical unit that has some additional medical supplies and treatments. Brad Neuter with CMH uh, is going to talk about Mobile Crisis, which is an initiative through community mental health that responds to short term uh, through phone or face to face interventions to people in crisis to de escalate the situation and address future safety concerns. Mobile Crisis builds rapport going out with street medicine in the Pines, but also serves the homeless response community in community meals provided daily, getting them connected to services. Addiction Treatment Services, Paula Lipinski is here. And she's going to talk about the fact that through QRT, ATS has prioritized QRT placement into withdrawal management or detox services and provides interventions for inpatient and outpatient treatment to individuals with substance use disorder. They serve the Pines residents daily in their services and work towards support, supported discharge planning. Uh, and then finally, street outreach. We have Dan Buren and Ryan Hannon here who will talk about Goodwill's street outreach program. They reach out to people experiencing homelessness and offer resources to help them find a safe and secure home. They are in the Pines several times per week and working to connect individuals in the Pines with the homeless response system and prioritizing <coughs> chronically homeless individuals to support them getting housing, which is the answer to homelessness. We also just want to add that this is not an all-encompassing list of agencies providing services in the Pines. We thank the homeless response system as a whole for coordinated entry to get people into housing. We thank Harm Reduction Michigan for their naloxone boxes placed in various locations around the city to prevent overdose and their response with community meals. Basic Needs Coalition for providing items that are needed in a coordinated way to the people of the Pines, Jubilee House and Safe Harbor for their shelter operations during day and night, and all 50 partners of the Quick Response Team who directly and indirectly assist the people staying in the Pines and others experiencing crises related to substance use, mental health, and homelessness. Okay, uh, Roger and Bree, please come on up. <laughs> all right, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm Roger Kirsten, I'm a family physician and I'm the medical director of outreach at Traverse Health Clinic. For us, outreach um, is almost all about uh, homeless care. 
Um, we have the mobile medical unit that Jen mentioned. It's a medical van, and we take it to various locations on a regular basis. Tomorrow morning will be a Goodwill Inn and Jubilee House, part of uh, uh, Grace Episcopal Church. Um, but every Friday in the summer, starting in four weeks, we go to the Pines. Um, this has been a very, very fruitful activity for us. We operate as a satellite clinic of the main Traverse Health Clinic on, on Garfield, and we can do most uh, of what the Traverse Health Clinic does out of that van. We do vaccinations, we prescribe medications, we have sample medications, we have splints, we have various things. And what we don't have, we often have run over from Traverse Health Clinic. Um, part of the power, I think, uh, of what we do is that we are there regularly every Friday for five or so months every summer and people can count on it and they come to trust us. Um, sometimes that trust takes a while to, to get because it's been, it's been lost from the healthcare system over uh, their, their lifetime. So um, my sidekick, uh, Bree will give a few examples of, of what uh, we do. Hi, I'm Bree Zika, and I'm a uh, recovery coach, and I also go with the street medicine team. So a few of the things that I wanted to add. Um, my first goal whenever I am out with the street medicine team is to establish a good relationship with anybody and everybody I interact with, because if you don't have a good relationship, they're not going to trust you for further care. So that is my number one goal, is just to get trust built, and with trust, then we can work forward on their physical health and mental health. And it gets to a point where we start to learn when somebody is starting to have a mental health crisis and we can get the correct individuals to come on board and help to make sure that it doesn't get to a point out of control. Um, one of my first encounters as once I started in this position, um, we met somebody who was in a significant mental health crisis and with a team of four of us, we were able to get them to the emergency department from the Pines, calling the emergency department ahead of time, notifying them about the patient's needs and what we were going to be bringing to them. So when we arrived with that patient, not only the patient felt safe, but the staff also knew ahead of time what, what the seriousness of this situation was. So that individual was able to get instant care instead of having to wait in the waiting room for who knows how long. Um, we've also helped with individuals with trach and peg tubes. You would not typically think people in the homeless community have trachs or pegs, and we have stumbled upon several of them who are now with established um, ENTs in our community to be able to have continuous follow-up care for trachs and peg tubes. Um, a big thing is also getting community resources. When I meet somebody new to the homeless community, my first goal is to also make sure that they know where the warm meals are, where they can get tents, sleeping bags, any kind of personal supplies. We also on our unit make sure that we carry um, blankets when we have them, um, coats, any kind of warm supplies, hand and feet warmers. Um, really anything to just get them through to so that we can get them to another to a better situation um, another thing we do a lot of basic checks vital signs we have people come tell us hey i was told once i was diabetic and they haven't been checked in months so then they start coming to us regularly for diabetic checks and we're able to better help them with that kind of care as well um, and another one that i am very excited about um, i met um, they just saw our mobile unit was sitting out one day and they came up and approached me and I have been working with this individual and they are now out of homelessness, now have housing, have a stable job and are in the process of getting their children back. All from just a quick, hey, do you need some kind of medical assistance? And it has bloomed into an amazing situation that I get to see and I am very grateful for. So. Um, that's just, I just hope to continue providing good quality care to those people because they definitely, they deserve it. Thank you. So just to wrap up, um, we have a nice collaboration with, with Goodwill, of course, with Munson Fine Practice Center, which provides um, physicians as well. And into the future, um, I think the additional community officer is great. The, the garbage cans are great. 
Um, in the long run, of course, the housing will be um, the biggest thing that we can um, provide for to contribute to our patients' health so that whatever we're doing, whether it's medications, some of which need refrigeration, um, home health, you know, whatever, um, that's, of course, in the long run, the big answer. Thanks a lot for having us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brad Neuter with Northern Lakes Community Mental Health. Sorry, I haven't been in front of a podium since high school. <laughs> so, um, I'm a part of Northern Lakes CMH. I am the mobile crisis slash community liaison. How I got involved was um, uh, one of our jail diversion workers, Sarah Bush, kind of brought me along to the community meals and he said, hey, I like doing this. And my supervisor at the time said, go have at it. So I started doing this by going out to the Pines and helping out and meeting up with Travers Health Clinic. And my background is in crisis. Part of crisis and mobile crisis in particular is to show up to a scene being called, whether it's by uh, Chief Richmond's officers, whether it's by a community member, whether by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's by the individual themselves, assess and determine if a higher level of care needed, whether that's crisis residential or inpatient. <coughs> if not, then we try to safety plan and connect to community resources, whether that is with Trevor's Health Clinic for primary care, whether that's with street outreach because of housing, whether that is with ATS um, for, for addiction. So my job is basically triaging the situation and pointing them in the right direction. Um, how does that work out in the Pines? Part of that <coughs> piece and my part of the community support is my view is prevention. How can we prevent someone from having a future crisis? And that is by getting them linked and coordinated. So like I said, to all those plus the 50 other community partners in the QRT is huge. Um, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. I mean, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, that's that's what I do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi there. My name is Paula Lipinski. I'm the CEO of Addiction Treatment Services. Um, Jen briefly talked about uh, what ATS does. Uh, we are what's called a full continuum of care for substance use disorder. That includes withdrawal management services men's inpatient residential, women's inpatient residential that allows women to um, bring their children with them. We have outpatient services. We have a um, MAT clinic um, as well as peer recovery coaches. We also have uh, six recovery homes within. We are in all of our services are located in the city, but we uh, provide services throughout the pretty much the whole state. Um, I will say that um, Jen, uh, she described, she talked about a, a web. Really, ICQRT is more a stir fry. I think what it does <laughs> is, um, and she's the chef. Um, I think what, what the QRT has allowed has, is all of us service providers. You have an abundance of amazing service providers in this community, and so many people don't know what we do. And Jen and the city police department got us all together and really started the process of getting it melding and getting the services for people throughout the whole community um, to be better serviced. Uh, the people that reside in the Pines are the people that are the primary focus because they are the ones that are facing um, you know, ho um, homelessness or ho lack of housing, uh, substance use disorder, um, and mental health. And I think that um, the even prior to the quick response team being created, um, we have uh, we established a relationship with uh, Trevor City Police Department um, that they want they do not want to criminalize the behaviors that I treat. Um, I'm a person in recovery, and I'm very sensitive to that fact. I don't believe that criminalization is the answer, but I don't believe that our police department does either. I think they're looking for other options, and the creation of this team was their first step. Um, and we were lucky enough to sit on the team to hire Jen, and Jen um, has just taken this and ran with it. Um, she really undersells herself uh, as far as what she's done, um, but she really, to get this many providers together and um, providers not make it about themselves and make it about truly helping is something that she has done. So what would I like to see happen moving forward? I think allowing um, what's happening really well to continue and grow. Um, allowing you know um, the program to expand to hire more people um, the community police officers they are another arm to support Jen um, and they too um, aren't just 
uh, going out and handing out tickets and you know um, looking at it through a punitive lens. Yes, they have a responsibility to that, but I can tell you that Chief Richmond has reached out to me on numerous occasions. Jen has reached out to me on numerous occasions, has reached out to my staff on how to better service people instead of taking them to jail. Um, a program that we specifically offer within uh, the quick response team other than responding to overdoses is uh, we have a direct pipeline and a process where if someone, uh, if law enforcement um, or the quick response team comes into contact with someone who is in need of withdrawal management services, uh, we have a way to get them in pretty quickly. Um, we established that well over two years ago um, and it's been working, it's been working pretty well. Um, we're hoping that, you know, uh, those beds can come in handy um, for people who are currently under the influence um, and want to continue on with treatment uh, to the next level of care. There's some people that kind of land somewhere in the middle um, that might be leaving jail and heading into um, other types of treatment. Um, sometimes they don't have a safe place to go, so there might be to afford us some creativity of looking at um, a place for that to happen. So. Um, I think that's all I have before I go over my time. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. My name is Ryan Hannon, Community Engagement Officer for Goodwill Northern Michigan. I want to thank the City Commission, City Manager, and staff for taking time to consider how we can ensure that the Pines are as safe as possible for everyone in the community. Recognizing that living unsheltered can never be safe and that homelessness is a serious attack on health, we are grateful Jen asked us to talk tonight about the services Goodwill Northern, Northern Michigan provides in the Pines. Our street outreach team reaches out to people living in the Pines, on the streets, in their cars, on their bridges, etc., to help them on their individual journeys out of homelessness into housing. This work involves doing several challenging things at the same time, building trust and helping people to have hope that something better is possible. This means being persistent and working with people over time connecting people with the resources they need to obtain the stability of permanent, permanent housing and have long-term housing success. This includes helping people with documents and completing paperwork needed to access services and housing, ensuring people have access to basic needs until, they're, until they end their homelessness and helping clients in the community understand the importance of stable housing as the starting point for work on other issues like substance abuse and mental health challenges. Street Outreach is just one part of a large, complex, high-functioning homelessness response system that we are fortunate to have in our community. It's important to understand that Goodwill and the Northwest Michigan Coalition to End Homelessness offer many additional services to people in the Pines beyond just Street Outreach. The Coalition is the backbone organization that coordinates our community's homelessness response, leading our shared vision, strategy, funding, policy, metrics, data analysis, and progress towards goals. Within this coalition framework, the coalition service, to, service providers, including Goodwill, implement on-the-ground strategies to respond to and end homelessness in our community. Goodwill and the homelessness response system include these additional services that are available to all people in the Pines. Number one, a call center that ensures coordinated services for everyone using homelessness response. Number two, three organizations, including Goodwill, that help the most vulnerable clients, those mostly likely to die in the streets, obtain housing with wraparound supports, so they can move, to, move out of long-term homelessness and have long-term housing success with help from rental subsidies and on-site case and property management. Number three, four organizations running five emergency shelters for people to stay in temporarily while they work on ending their homelessness. These shelters include Goodwill Shelters, the Goodwill Inn in Garfield Township, and Patriot Place for Veterans in Gaylord, and also Safe Harbor in Traverse City, which began as a winter shelter, moving from church to church until it received important support from the city of Traverse City and established a permanent downtown shelter space near other services needed for the unhoused population. Number four, 18 organizations in the Basic Needs Coalition that help people while they're experiencing homelessness with things like food, clothing, medicine, and day shelter. These organizations meet monthly to coordinate efforts. Members include faith-based organizations like Central United Methodist, Jubilee House, Father Fred, Safe Harbor, the Salvation Army, and St. Vincent de Paul, Jen, and the street medicine team that includes Munson Healthcare and the Trevor's Health Clinic. And it's all coordinated. Street outreach and other coalition services intersect with QRT mainly on law enforcement issues surrounding homelessness. We appreciate the city's community policing approach, especially because we know that the criminalization of homelessness makes homelessness last longer. It doesn't end it. We are grateful to live and work in a community that values the dignity of all community members and appreciate the relationship we have with TCPD working together towards shared goals. 
We support and encourage continuation of community police officer and QRT as outlined by our city manager. Our outreach team and the homeless response system as a whole do a number of challenging things at once. Here in Traverse City today, the city, the county, and the homelessness response system need to work together to do two very challenging things at the same time. One, as a community, we need to keep the pines as safe as possible while recognizing that homeless encampments will never be safe and are not the answer to the problems we face. Two, simultane simultaneously, we need to obtain more housing units with wraparound on-site support services. The only answer for the most vulnerable who have been homeless longer than one year and have a disability. Ultimately, we recognize that the safest and healthiest place for unhoused people is in permanent housing. We want to thank the City of Traverse City for your help in focusing on housing as the solution to homelessness. And we are happy to share some good news. We were notified last week that Goodwill Northern Michigan has been awarded LIHTC funding for East Bay Flats, in large part thanks to the pilot that you all approved. Your support and this LIHTC funding will help provide more housing units that will serve some of the people who today have no other place to go other than the woods and the pines. Together we're making progress. East Bay Flats is already playing an important role in our coordinated efforts to reduce the number of people who have no place to live. While we celebrate this success, we also need to redouble our efforts to secure the rest of the housing units we need to ensure no, homeless, no one is homeless long term. Cities all across the country that have high housing costs like we do are also dealing with large unsheltered populations. Like these other cities, we need to increase shelter beds that are available year round and, and double down on our efforts to expand permanent housing solutions. There are no examples of cities who have successfully managed encampments. What we need is year round, enough year round shelter and permanent supportive housing for the most vulnerable clients. We ask the city commission to join us in committing to do two critical, critical things at once. We need to work towards permanent transformation, transform, transformative solutions to homelessness while we ensure that our most vulnerable neighbors have a safe place in our community. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today about a critical issue we face as a community and, and thank you for um, allowing the, the city police and Jen to have this QRT team to where we can uh, coordinate together. Um, we weren't formally asked to provide information on how to make the pines better, um, perhaps during public comment. I can uh, do that, but um, really this is the crux of the matter. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Um, Jen, did you want to get up and say anything about to wrap it up or? Thank you. There you go. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so Jen. much. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you have and thank you for having us. Do we have any questions? Go ahead, Mai. Uh, so first of all, I want to acknowledge that I do work uh, at Travers Health Clinic. Uh, those were my colleagues who spoke, and thank you for um, sharing what you do when you are going out on the, our mobile medical unit. Um, so one of my questions is that you, know, that you mentioned that uh, the community police officer and your role are grant funded. Where, first of all, where are we in our grant funding? Where in the grant cycle? When does that run out? I can speak to my grant cycle. Uh, that is finished in October um, mm -hmm. of this year, and uh, and that will be the end of that. There is an optional no cost extension, mm -hmm. meaning we wouldn't get extra funding. Um, but if there was leftover funding, it might be reallocated into into a possible budget. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, so uh, assuming that there, well, even if there are funds available for a no cost extension, uh, once the grant is fully expended, then what? So it's my, it's my understanding that this position, when it was granted uh, by the commission, was written in a way where it is fully funded by our budget okay. and that any money we get in addition can be allocated to offset that. So and if we, if we wanted to expand and add another police <clears throat> social worker, would that require additional grant funding or modifying our budget? So, well, it would be both because I would ask for it to stay over but. Uh, talking with the grant, the grantees, um, any money that we have remaining in that grant could be utilized towards a second social worker. And again, as Jen indicated, there are some other programs that have not utilized their money and they're looking to reallocate those funds. And due to the success of the QRT, we are at the top of the, that list. One just coming. And then I have another quick question, if I may. Um, so you were also talking about uh, the addition of um, trash receptacles in the Novo area. Um, 
are, is there any discussion, I know it's come up many times <coughs> when we're hearing from the, no, nor, the Boardman Neighborhood Associations about needles in parks, needles in the yards. Um, is there any discussion or any plans to add sharps containers to uh, any of our public areas? Uh, that is something that we could explore. Uh, I, it has come up in the past. It's not the first time I have heard that. Okay. That would be something that we would coordinate with city parks, city staff uh, to explore those opportunities. Thank you. And just a quick little bit of background when this discussion started two years ago or so. Um, one of the <clears throat> funding mechanisms, we knew the grants would run out. It'd be great as long as we can get them. Yeah. But we also have had this uh, discussion about these QRT, even expansion of the services under the discussions we've had of our opioid settlements, as well as some of the other money that we get from some of those critical funds. Of course, every year budget it shows our, the budget shows who we are. So I, I think I would like to believe that this community will continue to support that. But that was also part of the additional incomes that were coming in, and um, especially the opioid money. I know has certain ties to it that this does qualify for, as I recall. So yeah, any the other grant questions? was specifically for opioid response. Yes. So. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners? Thank you all so much for your presentations and giving us a little snapshot there. And Jen, always a pleasure to get updates from you um, and all the great work you're doing with everyone. Um, this, as we've done with every other item, if anyone would like to come up and give public comment at this time, please feel free. Can I please ask for a show of hands of how many folks intend to speak on this topic? Okay, okay great. Uh, thank you. Please uh, come forward. You need to do the rules again. No. 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 Okay. Good. If you so remember you them, no, I, I don't. Know them. Okay. I know. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Halliday Schman, and I am the director of the Northwest Michigan Coalition to End Homelessness. Um, as my friend and colleague Ryan uh, mentioned, the coalition is the backbone organization that coordinates our community's homeless response. So it leads the shared vision, the strategy, the funding, the policy, the metrics, the analysis of the data. Uh, and the progress toward the goal of ending homelessness. I'm here tonight to acknowledge the challenges ahead uh, and offer support and expertise from our coalition as the city's plans to address homelessness continue to take shape. Our region is experiencing challenges that almost every major city across this country is facing. How to address unsheltered homelessness while at the same time focus on the root cause of this crisis, which is the current housing market conditions. Based on our national research and partnerships, we have not seen a community successfully manage large encampments, ever. Like, it has not been done. <laughs> However, what we have seen communities do time and again is prioritize emergency shelter while at the same time investing in the housing that will reduce homelessness. These are concrete investments we as a city can make and as a region to dramatically reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness not only manage it. As Greg Colburn and Clayton Aldern note in homelessness is a housing problem, as long as we continue to frame homelessness as an individual problem, we will struggle to make the structural investments needed to actually end it. Substance use disorder and mental illness are not root causes of homelessness. Addressing them alone will not solve this issue. To end homelessness, we must invest in reducing inflow into homelessness, the crisis response, meaning street outreach and emergency shelter, and permanent housing solutions. The partner agencies of the Northwest Michigan Coalition on Homelessness uh, tonight would like to formally request a study session um, with you all on the work to end homelessness in our community uh, in the future. Thank you all. My name is Harry Hubble. I live at 5351 Blair Town Hall Road. I have a business that operates in the community quite a bit, and I've been around the homeless community here for some 20 years. Um, I'm encouraged by what I've seen tonight. I was one of the persons with uh, Serving Up Love who was out in the pines on Saturday gathering things, and uh, it was a great group of people working with us. And I'd like to just cover a couple of things that were missed by some of the other folks who s spoke. Um, we weren't the only ones out there ahead of the city crews today that went out there and had a, holy crap, Batman, look at the trash that's piled up. Um, it was huge. Uh, the people who live in the Pines were helping us, and they've been helping us for some time. We handed out trash bags weeks ago. 
and over that period of time they've been doing their own collection which shows an attitude and attitude is one of the best things for a person in crisis to move on from where they're at so i want the commission to understand that attitude in the pines is changing um, secondly in addition to all of that uh, I'm happy to see that there's such a community group coming together now. Today the buzz on the radio was about the celestial alignment that hasn't been around for 20 years. <laughs> I've never heard of this type of community alignment that I'm hearing about here tonight that hasn't happened in this city before. So you as a commission group have an opportunity tonight to do something that's never been done before because of the amount of energy that you can get in motion here and do something to encourage. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about a whole lot comes back to too much of a buzzword in Traverse City, and that's housing. But we do need to create some more bedrooms. Um, creating bedroom facilities is a great way to start reducing the number of people who are in the pines. I think that a model, an SRO model, single room occupancy, is a great opportunity to do that. Um, it only, in a qualifying facility, the number of bedrooms you have can go quite a long ways to putting individuals off the street by accessing vouchers that are available. There's the funding for the vouchers is already there. The vouchers are stacked up. We need to start using them. Um, there are SRO models in the community that are doing this successfully right now. Dan's house is one of those SRO models, and Dan's house operates with one of the more difficult groups of the homeless community. They, op they take homeless alcoholics off the street and they do a very good job of managing that facility with them. Um, I'm fortunate I'm to be one of the board of directors there. I work with a great group of people and the board of directors has given me an opportunity to extend to each of you an invitation to come and visit our facility See how the Mr. Hubble, if you can wrap up real quickly, okay. or three minutes of the last. See how the SRO works. See how adding bedrooms can go such a long ways to pulling down this issue, and like I say, just just get with us. We'd be glad to have you come and visit and see something actually operating that would help the city out tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Bullock. I live at two two nine Wellington Street. And uh, my family has been a family that has been impacted by the homeless shelter on Wellington Street. And as many families in Traverse City have been impacted by negatively by, by the homeless problem. And I, I don't know exactly what the answer is. Um, my opinion is that a failure to enforce existing laws has led to quality of life issues and particularly declines around fighting, around using drugs at Eppenham Park and leaving needles uh, around littering, around congregating. And so it, I, I wasn't planning to talk tonight, but when, when Chief Richmond said that uh, the, the men's trail was added to the list of city parks where alcohol was banned, but then right after said, but you know, we're not planning to enforce it. It, it just kind of makes me wonder, it's like why, why extend a rule or why make a rule that you don't plan to extend? And it just kind of makes everyone roll their eyes and say, well, wh what other laws don't I have to follow? Um, what, you know, what, what, what is the point of, of making a rule that, that, that you don't plan to enforce and when all other rules aren't being enforced in our neighborhood that are causing my wife to not feel safe, that are causing me to not want my kids to go down the alley or go down the street to, to play with their friends. So I would just um, ask the city commission to maybe Think about that, and, and, and who, who determines that you're not going to enforce this no drinking in the Pines rule? Is that individual officers? Is that the police department? Is this the city commission? Is it the city manager? Like, who decides that there's a law, but that we're, we're just not going to enforce it? Um, I would appreciate if some of the other laws were enforced, such as the no fighting, the no drug use, the no, um, I, I don't even know what, what is legal and, what, and what's not legal, but, but this past winter in our neighborhood was bad and my wife doesn't feel safe walking at night, and my, my kids don't feel safe playing outside at, at, at certain points. And uh, so m making a law and then choosing not to enforce it, uh, in my opinion, makes everyone kind of roll their eyes and say, well, what, 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 are, what are we doing here? So thank you. Yeah. Any other public comment at this time? Mr. Hood? Wait. 
My name is Earl Gervais. I live at the Commons. And number one, thank you, everybody here, for what they do. I mean, it's, it's not easy, you know. You want to be merciful, and you balance mercy with truth. And it's not easy. My wife and I have worked at the different churches helping them. We went shopping at Costco. We filled up carts full of warm winter jackets, and we've taken great stuff over uh, to the church there. And I believe in helping people. I truly, truly do. And that's what you're doing, and you're, you're helping. Wow, you know, the, these are the not beautiful people of the world. These, uh, it's tough, and so thank you. My, um, concern is I live in the commons. The main entry to the commons, you have to drive by all of this. And many times I've seen trash out there for 10 days. And we had to call. We had to find out who was in charge of it. And you know what? We had to keep calling. And we had to keep calling because nobody was picking it up. Finally now, that's gotten better. There'd be cars parked along there, junky cars. And that pathway in there is very narrow. And you know what happens? People come in and they start looking at the, in the tents. They don't see the cars on the right-hand side. There's, we have people walking through the commons. I mean, they have green hair, purple clothes, 15 earrings, tattoos on their forehead, and looking like they're lost. We have them plugging in their cell phones next to our unit because we have electricity, outdoor electrical units, or, you know, plug-ins. They're sitting there charging their phones. I, have, I keep a 38 by my bed now because I see people walking through the commons, I mean, that do not look like they're stable. And so I'm telling you, you guys talk about how you've done this and this and this and this and this, and you sound like you're going to put up a condominium complex at, in the Pines. What are you going to do? Now, here's, here's something. I don't know how many there are homeless, but you've divided them up and said, okay, we're going to put, we're going to, in each one of you, you're going to put four in our backyard, four in your backyard, four in your backyard. You know what? It would change dramatically. But you're just saying, okay, we're going to leave them there. There's nothing better to do. Well, it's not. You know what? The Minervinis have spent their lives putting that place together and Excuse making it Excuse me, your beautiful. time for comment is the last, but for the record, would you please spell your first and last name if you're e willing? E-A-R-L-G-E-R-V-A-I-S. And Great. I'm friends with Thank Ray you. and Raymond, long time. And you Thank know you. what? Thank they you. They have time never, I, I want to make one more comment. And that's it. One the Minervinis have never complained. Never. And you know what? They're trying to finish all those buildings. And you know what? To get somebody, an investor, Mr. to come in, in there and all. do that, and then they run and they drive by the con. Thank you for your drive comments, by that. Sir. It's a slap in their face. Good evening. I'm Darcy Pickren, and uh, I just uh, want to first of all thank you. I met with Jen last week. Uh, I've been serving the underserved of this commuter community for about 30 years. I started with um, the Women's Resource Center. I went to the Goodwill Inn, Pete's Place, Northwest Michigan Community Action Agency. I've been on the board of BDAI before, during, after incarceration, and uh, I'm on, uh, I'm also volunteer for Keys to Freedom Ministry. I was in the jail last week. I do life skill classes there on Thursday nights. I've seen this merry-go-round of people, homeless, and uh, suffering from substance use and mental health disorder, disorders. I'm also a coach and a mentor to people. Um, I've been, uh, I haven't eaten today because I've been, uh, <laughs> I went, was in court this morning uh, in front of uh, Judge Stepka's court with one of my clients and her attorney. And uh, she's been homeless. She's been suffering from mental health disorders and I've been uh, her coach for over three years. It's been a roller coaster ride. But one of the things I want to say is that all of these programs are fantastic, but 
somehow we all got to come together. I've uh, been to the um, task force, the opioid task force settlement. I'm talking to Sheriff Shea about that. I've been working with him uh, for quite some time also. And I vet people in the boarding house, a boarding house. We also have Keys to Freedom Ministry homes and uh, for men and women. And so I appreciate what everybody's doing, but somehow if we could coordinate, maybe get a QR T team in the county and why are all these people in the pines let's disperse them in the community let's give them hope and encouragement let's find where are their families where are their loved ones how can we use our faith uh, uh, partners and our families to bring these people together and get them out of that area into housing I don't know if it's so much of a housing crisis is we've got so many people with money here they've got uh, you know bedrooms and uh, extra places to live and I don't have a tr I don't have trouble getting my people into housing and I just think if, if we kind of look out of the side of the box there may be a different solution and we could get some of these people out of the pines and use our resources to get them in the community working and taking care of their families and that sort of thing so thank you very much is there any other public comment on this item Seeing none, I will bring it back for a moment to say, um, as the city manager mentioned, she has a update that she has been working on. She has meetings in the next couple of weeks, even with partners both here and who were not here. Um, this was requested by a couple of commissioners to be done this week. So this is a tip of the iceberg of what's happening and who's talking. There are many groups, as was mentioned by the chief, 50 groups participate in this. We had a lot of talk about treatment, which is definitely part of this and what is being done immediately at the Pines, but supportive housing and other organizations are involved in, and projects are involved in QRT and our partners' um, work. So I just wanted to stress that there will be more of a complete picture coming down the line. Uh, one thing I did wanna do, because it was mentioned we have someone here who can um, address it, is the community court that's coming, the idea that we just don't randomly don't enforce rules that's not exactly the case. Um, you know, if Lauren could address, let's say we do arrest somebody for having a uh, intoxicant at a, a park, what they would, what, what would then be the process through the law? What would the community court look like if we can bring that back, please? Uh, if we can bring that community court, and I'm hopeful. I'm, I've been speaking with the district court judges, so we're at the beginning of that conversation. Um, the philosophy of code enforcement in the city. This goes for folks that are housed and for folks that are unhoused is to have people comply. Um, and so we work through our code enforcement officer, we work through community policing techniques um, with everyone across the board. And if compliance is reached, there's no reason to write someone a ticket. Um, for $100, you know, the city's not gonna get rich off $100. We don't even see that whole $100 after the court is done with that ticket. Um, the community court is the, um, it's sort of like sobriety court. It's an alternative court um, that uh, focuses more on uh, the services um, to get to the root of the issue that the person is uh, experiencing so that we don't see them again. And th these types of courts have seen and documented success. Um, when you send someone for treatment instead of sending them to jail, um, most of the time or a, gr a large number of the time, uh, they'll work through that process and it's a lot cheaper to do it that way and it's better off for everybody in the situation to um, offer that assistance to the person and help them have an off ramp. So community court is, um, the idea is that it would be another off ramp uh, for folks that do maybe end up getting a ticket for something um, that you might associate with uh, folks that are experiencing homelessness and uh, have that be an off ramp for them to have the connections to those um, service providers, uh, how it was done in the past, uh, um, and it kind of died off during COVID as some things did, uh, is that there are, there's a team that is assembled, um, includes the prosecutor, the judges, um, defense counsel, and a team of folks, a lot of them would probably overlap with people or um, providers on the QRT that then um, come up with a plan for that individual, whatever they're experiencing, um, their individual needs, and if they follow the plan to the end, um, they, you know, they could have their fines waived, they could have their 
their ticket waived, they could have warrants cleared, things like that. Um, there is research that, uh, that can substantiate that those are the things that become barriers to finding, to getting out of homelessness um, at the end of the day. So, you know, if someone gets a ticket for, you know, whatever, dr drinking and driving, right? They, they lose their license, they can't pay, they can't get to work, then they can't pay their ticket, then they have a warrant. Now when they try to go get housing, that warrant's gonna show up and they're not gonna be able to get housing. So things we know um, from the research that these things tend to snowball and if there's an off-ramp for that snowball to get people into services and to break down those barriers, we can help to get them out of homelessness in that way. And that I was kind of long-winded. No, so. it's, it's important, and that's the, that's the goal and why we do it. Now, let's say we did just to, because, again, of um, the, where we are right now. So let's say we did go in and arrest everyone in the Pines right now that had an attack skin on them. What would be the fine for that? Is there jail time? And I guess the point I'm trying to make is even if we enforce it because of the code is it's a fine, it's maybe a couple days in jail, correct? And it's then back out on the street and into this system that we've been dealing with, right. correct? So when we go back to that philosophy of compliance, officers have a lot of discretion in the field and they should. So, um, you know, nine times out of 10, and we do training with officers, and, and it's, a, it's part of the community policing model as well to de-escalate and get people to comply. And so nine times out of 10, through that process of, of de-escalation and community policing, if we can get somebody to comply and pour out their beer, maybe they don't need to get a ticket that night, maybe they don't need to go to jail, and that's within the officer's discretion. If somebody is not going to comply or if they're going to act out and become dangerous or be a problem, maybe they do need to go to jail that night. That's all within the spectrum of what officers can do in the field. Um, and so, you know, and that's across the board for everybody. You know, not, not every person that, officers give warnings. Now, I mean, every time you get pulled over, you don't get a ticket, right? So that's all part of that community policing philosophy and that philosophy of getting people to just comply with what the rules are and not just slam down on people with a ticket every single time, even maybe if you could. Um, that's not, that's not how, what the philosophy is. And if I'm speaking out of turn, I want Chief to stand up and correct me. <laughs> he's coming up, I don't know if he's gonna correct you though. He's welcome to correct me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna correct you. Um, officers have a lot of discretion. Uh, and enforcement, I am all for enforcement being part of the solution, but it's not the only part of the solution, okay? And as far as fighting, there's, there's a lot of different things within the laws that uh, dictate whether we make an arrest or we send a report to the prosecuting attorney's office to see if that is prudent to be enforced or if there's even a crime that's been committed. Um, so just because we don't write a ticket, because we don't, you don't see us arrest somebody for uh, fighting in the streets doesn't mean that we're not taking enforcement. It could be, but it does not necessarily mean that. A lot of times, majority of the times, we write a report, we send it to the city attorney, we send it to the prosecuting attorney's office, and let them make the final decision on that. Um, discretion, like the city attorney said, speeding tickets. Um, not everybody gets a ticket. Majority of people don't get a ticket when they're stopped. They're getting, they're told you're going too fast. These are the reasons why it's, it's bad and they comply. And that's what it takes. They get one warning and they continue on and they don't do it again. Now, if we need to enforce that because there's a behavioral issue, then we'll do that. And we'll try to change that behavior. Uh, but it's not just because uh, we have a law that we have to enforce it every single time we deal with it. And that goes for everybody. We could go down to St. Patrick's Day <laughs> downtown and there's a public intoxication or disorderly. We, could, we, don't, we don't arrest people every single time we deal with it. Hey, you're creating this. You need to go home for the night. You need to do this. They comply. We move on our way. So thank we you have a that. lot of discretion and we don't want to take that away from our officers. Yeah, thank you for that. I, know, I just know it can sound confusing when we say we're not enforcing rules that we put out there, but there's a method behind it, if you will. Um, I won't call it madness, but it's the best prevention we can try to do. And, and sometimes it makes the most sense, even if it doesn't seem like it would make the most sense. <laughs>
Jen, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, and I just wanted to add that, you know, there's a reason the jail social worker is part of our primary team, um, because we do imbue uh, enforcement as part of the solution as well. Uh, and so, you know, when those things are enforced, uh, I can also follow up with people in jail, and we do coordinate services right from jail. Uh, so it's not an either or, uh, this is both and. Um, and I think the, the point that Chief was trying to speak to was um, not trying to criminalize homelessness, uh, but trying to enforce ordinances. Um, there's going to be moves, if you heard the, the projects uh, that were talked about, uh, there's going to be moves to you know, potentially put out a list of ordinances that could be enforced, um, and that's part of the, the North Boardman Community Policing, and my role is to kind of go out there and encourage that proactive enforcement um, and proactive like things uh, that people can do, like taking down this or not having this out in the Pines area so that it potentially doesn't get that far. So hopefully go ahead and clarifies things. Thanks, Jen. All right, any other questions? Go ahead, Heather. Um, I, I think the title of this agenda item was how do we make the pines safer and cleaner this year. I, I, I think everyone up here fully realizes how unstable the environment is mm -hmm. and that it's a Band-Aid, it's not a solution. Um, what I'm hearing from the participants is supporting the expansion of the current effort, which is the tremendous potential of this QRT. Wow. Um, through the budget, uh, new hires. Um, but as uh, Ryan Hannon pointed out, a, an encampment is never a safe place to be. Um, so I, with this camera that's going up, the light, another dumpster, I would really support sanitation, running water, and electricity. If those, if it gets vandalized or if uh, uh, there's attempted vandalizing that goes on there, they, can't they be charged? They could be charged, they can be banned, they could be removed mm -hmm. from the pines. Um, trash collection is another one. Um, of course, Housing is the big pie in the sky here. And, and bedrooms, uh, for sure, you know, across the world, there are boarding houses. Across the world, but not in the United States. Um, we, we have to do everything we can to support housing. Reno just was able to enforce their camping ordinance just this last week because the counties and the municipalities we're able to build enough housing to get everybody out of the camps. Um, to that point, I believe, and Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but the circuit court order that we are under in our district, it, we cannot kick somebody out of the pines because it is it's up to the Supreme Court this month. Right. right. So but as of right now, it's so. fairly well publicized that this, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to take that up. Um, it's two different uh, decisions out of the one out of the Ninth yeah, Circuit and one out of our circuit federal circuit right now, whether or not um, those types of things can be enforced, uh, no camping ordinance, when there is no place for folks to go. And so that'll be Supreme Court ruling coming down late this summer, as they usually do. All right, so um, any other questions? Uh, public comments over. We have a general public com comment coming up in a moment, though. Um, so with that, We'll uh, thank everyone who presented tonight for that item, and now we're ready. Um, we are moving into general public comment. It can be about anything that was said tonight or anything in general that you want to address to the City Commission. Please for come forward. The same rules apply that, was, that were read earlier. Um, you had just said that it's all about improving the commons or improving the pines, and you want electricity, and you want running water. Well, why don't we just give them a park? We have parks, city parks, okay? You don't guys don't get it. They're not in your community. It's okay that they're in mine, because they're not in yours. I got an idea. They don't use the football field only for football season. Why don't we put them out there where it's nice, it's open, they got bathrooms, they got electricity, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know what? There's no trees, they can't hide, et cetera, et cetera. I've got a lot of ideas of where you can move these people. Now listen, I'm not against them, and I am thankful that you're here to help. But I don't think you're getting the point. They're not in your neighborhood. 
And it makes a big difference. When this gentleman says he has trouble, his kids are afraid to go out. Oh, I know what's going on. I see it. I see these people wandering around the village. Uh, it's, it's strange. I see him sitting right beside my house, swatted down. I mean, it, it puts, uh, if, you, if you come home and you have a homeless person on your porch, what are you going to do? What if you come home and there's a, whole, there's a tent in your backyard? It makes a lot of difference. You put running water in there. You know what's happening? We are in, thank God for what you're doing, but it's all, word has gotten out, and they're coming not just from our county. They're coming from other counties. They're coming from Texas. They're coming from Tennessee. I know this stuff. There, word is getting out. I tell you what, I just watched a video on YouTube. And it was a gentleman walking through the pines, filming everything. And it's going viral. And it talks about Tra this is happening in Traverse City. I took it to Trevor down at TC Tourism. And I said, Listen, look, Trevor, what, this is what's going on. I said, this goes viral. I mean, you've got a battle going on. It's going to affect people. And then you have a lot of these homeless during the summer. They are walking all over. And the tourists see this. We have a responsibility, yes, to do more. But I think we have to have housing. And it just can't be everybody saying, well, it's, the Pines is fine. The Pines is fine. The Pines, no, it's not. I don't want running water in there. I don't want electricity in there. I do not. Let's find a place. Let's have the leadership. I don't know all the rules... Uh, uh, for success, but I knew, do know the rule for failure, and that's trying to please everybody. And decisions have to be made that aren't going to be pleasing Your time to for everybody. comment has elapsed. We'll move on to the next speaker. Okay, my name is James Palmer. I live in Garfield Township, but uh, uh, oversee property in the, in the city limits. And I'm also a pastor of a uh, church in the county. And I'm kind of here tonight just and been participating with some of the cleanup days and we're trying to figure out our role, you know, our niche, how we can help as a church and do things. And one of the things that struck me as I'm just talking to people and listening, um, I know we kind of say, you know, we want to end homelessness, but I start to wonder if that's really a goal, if that's something more like the drug war that it's like, well, you can fight that, but that's not actually going to happen. Um, I've lived in Traverse City for 40 years, grew up in the city limits, and we've always had homelessness to some extent. It's been there. Um, I mean, we used to talk about the hospital being shut down, and that's where it came from. Well, no, and, uh, you know, that's moved on. We're going to continue to have it. And so I would be interested, just in light of trying to understand it better, as I think you are as well, it sounds like we've got a great system in place. I'm very impressed learning more tonight about that about dealing with the issues that are happening today, but what happens next year? What's our plan for five years? Um, one of my biggest worries with the Pines has been uh, that there might come a day when some jogger, some young attractive lady is jogging through there and gets attacked, and the public outcry is gonna be huge. And what's that gonna mean to the rest of the homeless population? Uh, that all of a sudden gets lumped in with that because they're not all the same. There's a lot of people out there that uh, are not criminals, and I think we've heard that tonight. So one of my questions, I guess, to you, or just an idea, is we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of money uh, doing studies, coming up with long-term plans for things like roads and highways. Um, I wonder if maybe there's a point where we start to look at this as a five-year, a ten-year plan and say there will never be an end to homelessness, even if we had enough housing. And I've lived in this town when I think housing was not as much of a problem, there still was homelessness. Uh, even if we have safe harbor open year round, uh, in my opinion, that might have 15 or 20 people in it in the nice months. A lot of those people don't want to live crammed in together. When it's nice outside, they'd rather be out camping. I would be. Um, so I think we need to come up with a lot of different solutions for the long term. and. Uh, and try to put those together. So, just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed, um, so I live in the Commons. I've lived in the Commons about 11 years. And 
you know, to me, I think it's, you know, half and half. I think it's half the city to blame, but it's also half of the property owner to blame. Um, because the homeowners associations and the village association and whatever associations that are around um, in the commons is they seem not to play good with each other. So if something happens after five o'clock, you can't get hold of anybody in the commons. There is no structure, there's no policy. And that's what's lacking. And so if that's what's lacking, then there needs to be some sort of um, reorganization of the homeowners association or associations that are in the commons. Um, because frankly, experience trying to call the police if something's happening is the the answer is well are you the property owner well no i'm not the property owner rent and my my community manager isn't around after five o'clock and so there's just something happens there's no there's nobody to get hold of and that's a problem that's an issue so like i said from the perspective of what i see it's half and half. It's half of the issue, and it's also half of the um, the commons issue. And bless my heart, I like the Mervines. I think that what they do with the co the state hospital is great and awesome. But there was no real plan, and if you don't have policy or some sort of you know idea of you know parking and other issues that come to the table, then that's gonna not bring investors in, that's gonna make a failure into that property. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Yeah, I will just say I was a little bit reluctant to come up at 942 after uh, two, two, almost a three hour meeting to say anything, but um, my name is Dan Bjorn. I'm executive director for Goodwill Industries of in Northern Michigan. I live at 242 East 9th Street. Um, and I just, I just appreciate it. There's a lot of energy, a lot of uh, attention on this issue. I think it's a great time to take on, I think what Ashley mentioned, is really do a little bit deeper dive. And this, this mm -hmm. is a complex issue. This is, it's not, there's not gonna be a simple answer, and it's not gonna be just one way of, of dealing with it. There's a lot of different ways of bringing this together, but we're gonna need the whole community to come together. Neighborhood associations, the police, everyone. And we have a real opportunity. We do have the ability, despite some of the things that got said today, to end chronic homelessness. I agree, there's gonna be a transient population but we know that 80% of the people come into the system, and we, we track this. We have a, sorry, I can't respond to that. Thank you, thanks. And you were about to say something. Yeah, I was, I was. <laughs> I'm just used to trying to cover the whole audience. Um, but we, we track this. We have, we, have a, we have a case management system. We, we know what people come in. We know when they leave. We know what happened. We keep case notes. And so we know that 80% of people come into the system are no longer in the system within a year. So what we're talking about with the chronic population people who have been in the system who have no other way of finding a way of ending their own homelessness. Those are the folks that we actually are able to get them into housing. That's a, that's a significant population. We can talk about the hospital bed problem. You used up three beds of 10 beds in a hospital with the same population. They're there all year long. You really only have seven beds. So we get those three people and get them into housing, and now I have 10 beds. We have more resources in the community. We know it's better for the population. So it's important that we have a safe place for people for the summer, but we kind of go down this path. Let's have a larger conversation about what we want to do as a community, because what we do and how we handle this is a reflection of who we are as a community. Mm -hmm. And I want to be thoughtful. I think we need to be thoughtful about what that is. We have a chance to really do something. We can be known really well for having great beaches, great place to retire, great place to raise your kids, and a place that cares about their citizens and finds real uh, solutions to how to make a difference in people's lives, and we can do this, and we're committed to helping out. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Any other comments? Gen again, this is general public comments, so even if you want to make a comment about something else, you can. Okay, seeing none, bringing it back. Again, I wanted to reiterate that this was an item that was requested to be on the agenda today, but there is a larger conversation happening in a couple of weeks here that um, in her 95 days, I believe it was, Liz has mentioned that she's taken a lot of meetings on and has several more. Um, that she'll be reporting on, including um, conversations with Housing North, which um, is not just the city. I'd like to reiterate to everybody too that yes, we have services in our city, our 8.6 miles, 
but housing does not that does not have to only be here for help be part of the solution so some people have mentioned they live in garfield township maybe you live in a different one there's tons of people who are willing to do housing outside of the city limits if there's opportunity so that gets into what you're zoned for and everything else so engage with your uh engage with trustees engage with everyone else too because this is a community conversation we're going to have a much larger one about what we can do what our partners can do uh, county qrt was mentioned that's in discussions actually already so there is a lot of outreach going on there's a lot of other bigger picture things going on we'll have a little bit of a snippet of that or a little bit of a picture of that bigger picture coming up in the next couple of weeks um, including and i know ashley had mentioned too wanting the uh, study session on a larger one and, and that'll be part of all of that so with that i look to my commissioners for any kind of final public com or comment if you want to say anything at all about anything tim so on this most recent topic and it was stated quite clearly that the pines is just a band-aid we realize it's just a band-aid it's not a long-term solution but the population that's in safe harbor now will be in the pines uh, here at the end of the month and we need to address that and we can as a community do better than we have in the past i was privileged to be able to attend the qrt meeting um, at the end of last week uh, and even there one of the potholes that was mentioned is could a dumpster be put at the south end so that when there are trash pickups twice a year currently that maybe there's not so much in there you know people it was pointed out they don't want to live in squalor they don't um, so what can we as a community do uh, to make it better it, it's better for the residents there in the pines and it's better for uh, all the support services that are going in there you know street medicines in there every Friday others are in there multiple times a week let's make it better for, and more comfortable for all of them and it helps them build trust with the population in there and helps them provide the services more effectively so it is just a band-aid the pines are a band-aid it's not a long-term solution and, and we know that but it's what we have right now and we can't just uh, we uh, can't and the community can't just continue on um, and say well yeah it was kind of caused an uproar last year I suppose it'll be an uproar again this year it very well could be an uproar again this year but I feel a responsibility to at least be asking the questions what what can be even incrementally better this outdoor season than last outdoor season so I appreciate everybody uh, being in attendance here um, all the comments even those that are very critical of what's going on and unhappy with it uh, because we're all part of the same community and, and we're only going to move forward when we uh, keep at it so thank you and i'm <clears throat> excuse me i would add to that that pointed out there are a lot of people working on this every day and meeting several times a week to coordinate and things do happen that you can plan for the best and even the worst and still be surprised and that is where I think these um, everybody at the QRT and all the other organizations the coalition and homelessness come together to discuss issues as they come up so as people are looking to help there's volunteer days there's um, the basic needs um, that Ryan Hannon mentioned briefly but you know I know a lot of people have well intentions of uh, taking coats and foods and things like that um, it was mentioned take them to a participating church contact the basic needs donate to places like the trevor's health clinic that are doing the work in the meantime because all of that support helps too for them to become more robust as we mentioned we're probably adding another officer we've got an officer now every day out in the pines instead of splitting their time that's the allocation that we're doing as our funds already and looking to add to that so it's also that's also part of the community effort for those who want to help but aren't sure what they can do that's another great thing that's out there so this is going to be a bigger conversation this is a bigger um problem with a bigger solution but i agree with tim and i think everybody up here that uh, agrees as well that this is not the pines is not how do we make this a sustainable thing for years to come it's how do we help people move into housing how do we help them find solutions and how do we keep them safe and healthy in the meantime help keep people and our neighbors safe and healthy in the meantime so with that unless there's anything else i will adjourn this meeting thank you all for participating in all the discussions tonight and we will see you soon Right. Oh, so, like, close